Good evening. Welcome to the uh, Wednesday, April 25th meeting of the Cape Elizabeth Town Council Finance Committee. Um, picking up from where we left off last night, uh, our meeting tonight will consist of uh, carry over a few discussion points and questions, uh, opportunity from last night's meeting. Um, we'll also then um, uh, have discussion around some of the other non-school related uh, items um, included in the budget and um, new information that um, you know we have to review on that and opportunity for questions and discussion on that as well. Um, so before we begin though, uh, as was the case last night, if there's anybody from the public that wishes to come forward and speak uh, on uh, the first item on the agenda, you're welcome to do so at this time. Please limit your comments to approximately three minutes. And the total time for, um, for public comment will be 15 minutes unless uh, the council votes to extend that. So seeing our first person, would you please give us your name and address and again, comments to about three minutes, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My name is Harold Patius. I live at 882 Shore Road. Uh, I have lived in town uh, all but a few years of my 82 years. I uh, moved here in 1940, and uh, since that time, but for four years in New Jersey in college, eight years in Washington, D.C., uh, in the government, two years in the, uh, at sea in the United States Navy, I have lived in this town. And um, I come not very often uh, to these meetings, but I did come last night. And uh, because of that, I decided to come back again tonight and just say something. Uh, this is not a battle. What, what I see going on here is not a battle between those who believe in education and support education and those who don't believe in education and are against education. They all, everybody in this community that I've known over almost 80 years of living here shares those values. That's why the schools are good here. For that reason, uh, I went through these schools beginning in kindergarten. I went through Cape Elizabeth schools and uh, it was a different time and a much smaller operation. And we had, uh, uh, because we couldn't afford everything in those days, we had a superintendent for Scarborough and Cape Elizabeth, a business uh, administrator for Cape Elizabeth and South Portland. So it's not us versus them. Everybody is a stakeholder and everybody is for first class education. I think what happens sometimes, and I listen to what people have to say, appearances uh, mean a lot. I worked in Washington for a president who turned the lights off in the White House at night. It was kind of crazy, but it was for appearances. He was sending a message. He became the greatest spender in American history. Lyndon Johnson, the greatest spender in American history. And nobody regarded him as a big spender at the time because he did little things, appearances. And so all of those things count. And I urge you to do it. I'm a stakeholder. I pay a good size property tax and I don't mind paying it. I want good schools. But you know, every time I go, this is just an, a story about appearances. Whenever I go to an athletic event, which I do often, if it's an away game, uh, and particularly in the winter, the bus sits outside for two and a half, three hours. If there's a JV game, sometimes four hours. The engine's running. Now, appearances, it isn't going to save much money. It isn't going to affect anybody's property rate. But it sends a message that little things like that uh, count, and everybody's watching, and there's some oversight. So, uh, I was just looking at this today. This is uh, from the National Advisory Council on State and Local uh, Budgeting, uh, put out by the Government Finance Officers Association. And they say two things. Because I watch this happen every year, this back and forth. Must have a long-term perspective in government budget m making. The process is not simply an exercise in balancing revenues and expenditures one year at a time, but is, a str is strategic in nature, encompassing a multi-year financial and operating plan that allocates resources on the basis of identifiable goals. We shouldn't be having this kind of battle every year which is reactive. We, you can look ahead 
and know what's going to happen. And I'll tell you, I heard somebody here last night saying, you know, we got to get together and fix the, uh, the allocation program at the state level. Whenever, there's only so much money appropriated. And if you get more, Callus is going to get less. That's just the way it works. And I will tell you right now, those kids in Callus need it more than we do. So I suggest to you that's not the solution. What you need to do, and you can't do it now, but is to look ahead, do long-range planning, think about the future, and think about a long-term plan. Because you can't do this every year. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, uh, Jerry Kneller, 18 Ivy Road. Uh, Chairman Garvin, uh, most people come up and make statements. I have some questions seeking clarification. Is this the appropriate form and protocol to, to do those and ask those questions? Why don't you ask your questions and we'll, we'll figure out the best way to respond. Perfect. Yeah. So uh, as part of the budget process, I've seen the town proposed tax increase of 0.2% and the school board proposed tax increase of 10.2%. What is the overall blended tax increase? Is it additive, so 10.4%? Is it a simple average, 5.2%? Is it a weighted average? What is that number? How is it derived? How is it communicated to the town residents? What is the forum to do that and for public comment? That's sort of my general question, number one. Okay, I know Matt has that answer, so maybe, maybe go on to your next one. And, sure. Yep. Uh, the second question is, at a recent town council meeting, I talked a little bit about some ideas, putting rigor and discipline around sources of funding and some creative ideas around that. And uh, again, I, I'm not seeing that process brought to bear uh, with workshops or town council discussion, et, et cetera. And again, I'm, I'm talking about sources of funding to maybe alleviate the excessive tax increase that we're looking at for this year. The gentleman that just recently made a statement is spot on the right way to do this to take a long-term perspective, but we are where we are, so I'm trying to understand, at least in a one-year perspective, where that is. There are some creative ideas to do that, looking at borrowing capacity, leverage, looking forward a little bit at upcoming revenue ideas, looking at policy changes. There's a whole bunch of things that you can do to look at that besides just looking at the expense side. So I guess I'm asking, where is that process as part of the budget? How is it made transparent, and how does the public respond? Those are my questions, thanks. Okay. Um, Matt, do you want to address the first question, which I know you have the answer to right there? Sure, I'd be happy to, Mr. Chairman, thank you. Uh, what we are looking at right now, as, as it currently is situated, is a 7% net change on the increase on the tax rate. Last year, uh, or $1.26 on the mill rate, and that's with everybody in play. Uh, what you're looking at is a two cent drop on the town side, uh, three cent increase on the county side, uh, dollar and a dollar twenty nine uh, increase on the school department side. That's how that, as currently configured, that's how that breaks down. The pre, uh, sorry, the prior year's tax rate was eighteen dollars, and then as as it's currently constructed, you're looking at nineteen twenty seven. More or less. That can uh, the one thing I will say, Mr. Kneller, is that 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 may change by the time that the assessor goes to commitment. Uh, based on new valuation that is added uh, to the tax rolls. Uh, he's currently in the, in the process of assessing you know, new homes, additions, things like that that took place, land splits that add to the aggregate value that may impact that to a certain extent. Uh, I don't want to set the bar too high to say that it would be a Herculean jump downward, but it will make a subtle impact to that, what the final number ends up being at the commitment of taxes. Um, to your second question, um, I would say that, number one, that there's certain statutory um, and charter-based um, um, parameters around, you know, sources of revenue feeding different areas and things like that. So I think your point about taking a longer view and, and potentially making some more specific policy changes is something that certainly um, in the current and predicted climate um, for, for funding is something that's probably worth exploring further. On, on a historic basis, I would say that it probably hasn't been done, and I invite anybody else with more tenure or experience to weigh in on this as well, 
hasn't been done as much because there haven't been many years uh, in the recent history where there's been such a, a significant gap on the revenue side comparative between the two, the two functioning um, parts of the, the overall town organization. Um, I think the genesis of your question is a good one in that it echoes what Mr. Patius was just saying about everybody being in this together, number one, and number two, seeking creative solutions is something that I think um, is a good guiding principle as we continue our discussions and deliberations. So, um, but if anybody else wants to weigh in on the second part of my comment about um, sort of the, the historic view of cross-pollination of funds and things like that. Chris? Uh, very briefly, uh, not historic, but going forward. My understanding, uh, and you guys can fill in uh, a vague understanding, is that on the town council side, after this budget cycle, we are planning on holding additional workshops to look at more long-term planning and adopting a long-term planning approach. Am I getting this right? All right. Um, and my, I don't know if you were, I, were you at the meeting last night? Yes. I think if I recall correctly, the school board also indicated an openness to adopting a similar approach as well. So um, I, I wasn't a town official last cycle. I was somewhat oblivious to all of this going on. I think the good people of town, a uh, number of people in town are, for me at least, this has been a wake up call uh, as to how critical the situation is with respect to the funding from, from the state. So I hope that's been the case with everyone this year, such that we realize we do need exactly like Mr. Paccio said, that <laughs> I couldn't, uh, I could never say it as well as you did. That was phenomenal. Um, but yes, we realize, at least I realize the critical nature of the situation and I'm going to be, and I think there's consensus here that we are going to be focusing on long-term planning, looking three to five years out and trying to come up with more creative ways to deal with the solution, the problems we're facing. Is there anybody else that wanted to offer a comment on that? No. Thank you. Thanks. Other members of the public that wish to speak? I'm Tom Dunham. I live at 11 Becky's Cove Lane, and I spoke to you two weeks ago, and it was on health benefits and insurance. <clears throat> and Jamie <clears throat> responded, I think, um, and it was encouraging to me that you would consider <coughs> exploring that. <clears throat> Others kind of dismissed it. Um, <clears throat> today, I spoke to Clark Insurance, and I talked to the person that's head of benefits. <clears throat> and they are in discussions starting right now <clears throat> in Yarmouth with the school superintendent to look at their insurance programs. So <clears throat> when I'm going to, I'm going to challenge you tonight, and I, <clears throat> I'm going to ask you to please reach out to the town of Yarmouth, particularly the superintendent, see what they're doing, and come back and report to me and others by the end of the week. <clears throat> I'm also going to ask you, because it would make sense to me, that you reach out also to Cumberland in Falmouth. So we have four towns, and we ought to have a lot of leverage by <clears throat> looking at um, improving the um, cost of these programs by going out to competitive bid. <clears throat> the other point I'd like to make is um, on the agenda you're talking, this discussions tonight on senior citizens' property tax relief. I view that <clears throat> as a establishing another entitlement in this town that is unfair very likely <clears throat> to many of the citizens. Um, I think you need to balance your budget <clears throat> and not uh, create another entitlement in this town if you, if, in, 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 on this basis. If you do, then what happens next year? <clears throat> and, and you have a deficit. Are you going to increase the entitlement to uh, a few people? I, I just think it's going down the wrong direction. Thank you. Thank you. Others that wish to speak? Good evening. Uh, my name is Wyman Briggs. I'm at uh, Three Mountain View Road in Cape Elizabeth. And as a member of the Cape Elizabeth Land Trust uh, Board, I'd like to speak on behalf of the uh, uh, contribution um, from, the, from the town towards the procurement of Robinson uh, Woods Three property. Um, Truly iconic opportunity, a very unique opportunity for the town. Uh, 51 acres adjacent to the Robinson Woods One and Robinson Wood Two property, right on Shore Road. 
you know, across from uh, Pond Cove, kind of right in the middle of town. Um, properties, Robinson Woods 1 and 2, already used on a daily basis by hundreds of Cape Elizabeth land uh, or residents um, throughout the year, Nordic skiing, snowshoeing, biking, hiking, just an opportunity to, to be outdoors. And I wanted to highlight you know, the results that many of you are, may already be aware of from the 2017 Comprehensive Plan Survey in which Cape Elizabeth uh, residents cited that 97% of them supported policies towards protecting environmental quality and 96% of residents supported protection and preservations of wetlands, ponds, and woodlands. This even exceeded the 79% uh, of those surveys who supported a uh, greater investment in public school facilities and 75% uh, who supported expanded public education programs. Uh, as a father of uh, three Cape Elizabeth uh, public school graduates and the husband of a um, Cape Elizabeth middle school teacher, I gotta be careful here, um, <laughs> but uh, just want to recognize that uh, protection of, of uh, Cape Elizabeth's um, natural resources is really critical. It's something which we can do. Uh, it's not often where we can uh, set aside an iconic property in, in perpetuity. Um, so I just wanted to, um, this has been a partnership that, uh, that, that the town and the Cape Elizabeth Land Trust has, has used before. And um, both during Robinson Woods One and Robinson Woods Two, uh, the town contributed uh, one third towards the procurement, which really uh, is critical in making this happen. So, thank you. Thank you. Any other citizens wishing to comment? Nobody. Okay. Thank you very much. Appreciate the input. Um, so I think what we'll do is pick up, like I said, where we left off last evening um, with some of the um, carryover discussion items. Um, one of those was, um, I know, interest on the part of the council and I'm sure on the part of the school board too in getting into further discussion about the um, school resource officer, um, which I know that during the budget preparation process there was a lot of um, deliberation about on the school board side, presentations from um, both other principals, from neighboring communities, um, from uh, an actual school resource officer, from Chief Williams, uh, who's here tonight. Um, so I'm gonna turn it over to Matt, and I assume Chief Williams uh, as well, to speak a little bit about, um, about that particular item, um, because it's not something that's included in the proposed school budget, um, but is, um, I think, ha has been expressed as an identified need uh, in search of funding. So, Matt? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, yes, I, I did have the opportunity to have the Chief come out tonight. Thank you, uh, Chief Williams, for coming. Uh, shortly after the discussion with the school board had taken place, uh, at least at their budgetary level, we started to look at the uh, what the options would be as far as potentially providing or the mechanism by providing a school resource officer at the Cape Elizabeth School Department. Uh, so what I asked the chief to do was look into a couple different mechanisms, one of which was to say, you know, there are grants that are out there, there's a COPS grant that has been available and what was the potential for that and look at it kind of on two different approaches. One would be from a COPS grant perspective as well as if we just added that officer directly uh, to, uh, to the line, if you will. Uh, so I asked the chief to do a couple of uh, analyses that came to that, what the cost would be to provide that officer under both, and uh, as well as uh, what the opportunities are for, for grants available. So if uh, the chief would be so kind, I wouldn't mind if he would come up uh, to, the, to the lectern and he can describe it a heck of a lot better than I can because it's, it's his area of expertise, but. <clears throat> Good evening. Thanks, Chief Williams. It's uh, unbelievable to see everybody up here. <laughs> um, yes, uh, um, we were fortunate enough to have uh, the SRO from Falmouth um, speak to the school board, and also uh, the principal of York High School spoke to the school board. 
And um, I think uh, the school board would agree that it was all positive. Um, and um, I know that uh, the superintendent and myself, before the budget um, really got going, spoke of a collaboration in order to share funds for an SRO. Cape Elizabeth is one of two in Cumberland County that does not have an SRO. Um, and the other SROs that have been in their school system has been there for quite a long time. Um, I think it's time to um, look at it harder. And the reason I say that is because uh, we can see what's happened in, in the country. And um, every time one of those incidents happen, my phone comes off the hook. And then two to three weeks down there, I look behind me and it's just me. And so I think it's time to really look at it hard. Um, the, the people uh, appreciate us, the citizens appreciate us after one of these incidents happen. And um, we do everything we can to put a Mark Cruiser out there to try to take an officer off another project and put him in the school. Not picking on the principal of the high school, but after the last one, asked if we could have an officer down there for at least three to four hours every morning. Um, we don't have those um, officers to do that, but we did do it. We, we took, those, uh, took officers off other projects and did do that. So I think it's time that we look at it a little harder. Um, and so after uh, the meeting with the school board, um, they talked about the budget, and then I got an email from the superintendent the next day. I think Matt was copied on it, town manager. And uh, he said it, the monies just weren't in the budget to do that. So I shipped uh, Matt a, a letter, and I think it, you probably all have that. And there's, to me, only two avenues to look at, and one would be a COPS grant. However, in a COPS grant, uh, we received an email probably two weeks ago stating that they, uh, the COPS grant will not come out until after the president's budget, probably two weeks after that. That's probably going to be past our budget time. Um, also, when you do a, a grant, you put the grant in in um, the spring, and you don't hear whether you get the grant until the fall. Um, so that really puts you, you know, behind behind the eight ball. So my other my other only option to um, present to you was here's a dollar figure that I have. Um, back um, along in November, I was kind of thinking ahead. Sometimes that happens, <laughs> and um, I uh, put in what's called a John Doe slot at the academy, and what that does is that. That gives us, at, at midnight, at the night that the academy starts for the next uh, BLEPI session, is what they call it, you can put in a John Doe request, which I had the laid out sergeant at 1201 put in that <coughs> BLEPI request, that John Doe. So I think that we have, um, a, we will have a slot because they fill up very quickly at the police academy in August. So if a new person was to come on and they needed the academy, we would have one in August. Uh, unfortunately, it's 18 weeks, and so 18 weeks is August to December, so we don't get that person back till Christmas. However, keep in mind that regardless of whether it's a grant or we hire a new person from just outright budget, that's not the person that's going in the school person going in the school would be somebody that we have on now, and we have two eligible people that, that I can see right up front, there might be more, but uh, that person um, would be in the school and the new person would fill their slot on the road. Uh, just so you, you know that, and I'm not gonna take somebody brand new and just throw them into the school, that wouldn't do it. Because you have to have, as the SRO from Falmouth, stated, you have to have the right person. And the principal from York stated the same thing. You have to have the right person that can meld with the kids well, can, can be the arm of the, of the school staff, and, and uh, be together and work on the same page. So 
that's where we are right now, um, and that's why I gave the letter to the town manager to present to the um, um, town council. I didn't know it was going to go to the school board, too, but um, there we go. Thank you, Chief Williams. Um, either Howard or Susanna, would either of you like to speak to some of the thought process the school board went through in considering this item and how you landed where you did in not including it in your budget, but keeping um, sort of a focus on the identified need? Either of you? Maybe you can both answer it. I'll, I'll start um, and can fill in. Uh, we, we really uh, seriously considered including it in our budget because we do believe that um, as, as research is beginning to show that it has a very positive impact on the culture within schools, uh, particularly the younger um, the, the police officer is integrated in the school system, the more effective it becomes over time. Um, you know this, I'm talking to you, but you know this. Um, so we, we felt that given, given the climate of, of our nation, um, now with the, ser the time to seriously consider it. Um, and then when we started looking into the fact that most of the towns that we, we looked at um, within surrounding neighborhoods have um, their SRO officers uh, funded by their towns or the police department directly. And given our constraints and budget um, you know, issues this year, and given that we are trying to shift, um, like many of us have said, that the culture of looking at this is not a us against them, but as a one town issue, we felt that this was an appropriate request to ask of the town um, to include in their budget. So that's, that's my perspective. Do you want to add anything else? I guess what I would add is, um, first of all, I want to um, recognize and, and publicly um, acknowledge appreciation for the services that we currently receive from the police department. We enjoy um, an officer being in our buildings weekly. Um, not every day, not all day, but um, the officer knows our schools, knows the, uh, the uh, students to some degree, not to the degree that he would if he were there full time, but we do really do appreciate the time that we do get currently, and that's um, all paid for by the town. We thank you for that. Um, we, I think it was last year, Two years ago, we actually raised the question at the board level, would we be interested in um, moving toward having a full-time school resource officer? And the board unanimously said at that time, absolutely, now is the time we're ready. That was, that was two years ago. And so we've been interested in this for some time, and we remain uh, very interested in having a school resource officer. Um, it isn't in the budget because of of uh, the fact that our budget already is is so high. Um, a question was raised last night, I think it was um, something like, why is it, do you have in your budget a additional custodian and not have the school resource officer? I think that was the question that was raised last night. And um, it, let me, um, I, I wasn't seeing it as, um, my recommendation wasn't undervaluing or to, de to um, devalue the, the, value, the value of a school resource officer. It was the fact that, again, as I said last night, we've had, during my time here, two different facilities directors. Both of those directors said that they are understaffed in cleaning our schools. I met with our custodians and maintenance crews and bus drivers last summer, and the maintenance crew said they were understaffed, and the custodial staff said they were understaffed. And you have to take seriously what people are saying that. These are people who are doing this work, and they simply can't keep up with it. And there's something terribly important about having buildings that are clean and sanitary and fresh and inviting for students and for our, our faculty and staff. It um, may not seem as um, dramatic as having a school resource officer, but again, I point out that we have had, and I'm gonna assume that we're gonna continue to have some part-time assistance 
um, from the police as we have enjoyed so far. And I want to remind people that we have the benefit right now of not being, having our police department miles from our schools, but it's, it's literally yards. And it's, they're, they're all on one campus. So that it's, a, it's a, a, a lovely advantage that we have. Um, I still would love to see a school resource officer in, um, the, in our schools next year, but we have schools that are not as fresh and as sanitary as, as they should be, and that's embarrassing to me, and it's demoralizing to our faculty, and, and I think that it doesn't speak well to our students about the value that we place on education in our public schools. So that's why I've added uh, a custodian. I want to again say this, I, we added a custodian last year to this budget because of the same very reasons and that custodian is not working in the, in the high school, he's working in the pool. I'm, I'm glad he's there, I'm sure it's important that he's there, but he's not in the schools. And so I'm concerned about the schools, not so much about the pool. And I would be tickled if it's this decision of the town to, to finance a school resource officer. Matt, any comments you wanted to make about um, sort of what you know, Chief Williams talked about us being one of the only towns that doesn't have one, um, and also what some of the other funding mechanisms are? Well, it is. Yeah. It, uh, <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, there is a, you know, what you find in, in some towns there, there's, there's sometimes maybe a hybrid approach where, like for instance, where I live, the town uh, picks up. Well, the town and the school department, but it's an SAD, share the cost of the, of the school resource officer where for three quarters of the year, the, the officer is in the school, so the school picks up that, let's say nine months of it, and then the other three months of it, the town picks up that share. So we had discussed that as a possible funding mechanism earlier, but I know with their fu funding challenges, that's why you know, when, uh, when Superintendent Coulter reached out to me, he'd indicated that that was just gonna be a, a bridge too far for them for this year. Uh, the other thing to think about uh, is that the estimated cost of this officer is going to be approximately ninety thousand dollars? So, and but if we do find a grant, the grant is a three-year grant at approximately one hundred twenty-five thousand. So you're looking at roughly forty-one and change per year that would come off uh, as a reduction if we were so granted that grant. Now there's a leap of faith that takes place if you were to say, you know. We, we operate on a July 1 budget, right? So if we approve everything, if the town approves the budget and the, then the, then the school budget gets approved, you move into your fiscal year with that person in your budget with the high hopes that perhaps you find that you do receive that grant. So uh, one option would be to put place that in there, apply for the grant and hope for the best. Uh, but at the same time, I think it would be fiscally irresponsible for me to tell you to not plan for 90 grand if you're going to do it. I think the responsible thing would to say, you know, if you're looking for a grant and you're putting your hopes on that, there's always the chance that you don't receive it. So that's what, uh, so I would say if you were looking at that, look at that from the, from the hard number and hope, and hope, but realistically expect to, to fund that level, depending on how you want to do it. Other questions from counselors, Chris? Uh, so um, um, can we do what you said, but, uh, make the hiring conditional on reception of the grant. Basically, we, we put the line item in. If we get the grant, we do the hire. If not, we roll the money into the general fund. It... Chief, what are your thoughts on that? If, if I could just speak to that. Um, <clears throat> one thing is, is it's quite a bit of time for the hiring process. Uh, it's just not getting an application and saying you're hired through an interview process. There's a lot of hoops that that person has to jump through, polygraph, psychological, physical, um, uh, physical agility, and, and things like that. So we could do that. Um, you would assume that grants would come out in September uh, of the awarding of the grant in September, and therefore you could have a John Doe slot for the January. One thing you have to realize when we hire is we don't know what that person's gonna have for experience. It could be a person that already has the academy. Therefore, it's just a changeover and the, the, that person doesn't have to go to the academy. 
and can start. Obviously, we have a field training program of eight weeks, um, so they'd have to go through that. But um, the person also could be very new and have to go to the academy. And the pricing that I put up there is that I put that person had one year experience. So I, I don't know where that person from, from the hiring process is going to come in on the salary scale. So I kind of ballpark. Penny? Um, yeah. Um, when we were doing the municipal budget, I, I didn't ask this question, but it, um, it was kind of, um, seemed odd to me. I, I truly believe public safety is the responsibility of the police department in our town. I understand that uh, we had hopes of, of sharing um, a, uh, a resource, but I think that in itself starts to create some challenges. And when we were doing the municipal budget, I, I had thought about that, why doesn't this person just be part of the police department? Um, because that is a service we should provide to all of our citizens is safety. It doesn't matter whether they're kids in schools or where they are. I believe strongly that, and I have believed this for many, many years, um, that uh, police officers belong in the schools for many, many different reasons. And in this day and age, it's so sad that um, some of it is about safety, but that whole relationship, that whole um, um, what a police officer can represent in a school I think is really important. I do want to know what the ripple effect is through the budget for the municipal side, but I have to tell you that this is like a no-brainer from my perspective, because I don't want to be sitting here and hear that something happens in our school and young people are impacted. So. Go ahead, Matt. Uh, Councilor Jordan, I, I, in planning for this evening's uh, conversation, I thought it would be helpful to at least, know, as you just asked, what the impact would be if this expenditure was added to the town side or added to the budget. You're basically looking at adding six cents to the mill rate. Six cents. So that's uh, that's. <laughs> Six cents. That, that would be the uh, impact on it there. So, um, so instead of being at 19, 26, 27, you're looking at 1932. Yeah. And I, I just think we shouldn't be short sighted. Yeah. I mean, everything we do from this point forward has to be with a look to the future. It's not about the moment in time any longer. And I think that we need to be cognizant of that. Council Randall? Uh, Matt, is that number at, you said, count on 90,000 for the position. And I know one thing we had discussed previously um, with the chief was that that position might help alleviate some of the overtime costs. Does that number take into account any decrease in, or possible decrease in overtime costs? Do we know what that would be? Could I speak to that, Matt? Yep, that'd be great, Chief, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> you have a much better answer than I have, so. <laughs> no, because uh, um, Councilor Straw brought that up also. And, and I agree that that can happen. However, I don't think it will happen in this budget year, or if it does, it's a little less. And the reason being is that most of our overtime, that that person will have an opportunity to, to cover for us, will be in the summer. Mm -hmm. And if we hire that person this year, the summer's all gone. Yep. So it will be in the next fiscal year, and, and I'm sure that um, we'll give it a shot in order to try. I just don't know how it's going to roll out. I don't want to commit that we're going to save 20, 30. I wouldn't like to do that. But just so you know, it won't, I, I can't see most of that happening in this budget year because of when that person will come in. Council Lennon. So do we currently have a full-time SRO in Pine Cove Middle School? No, we do not. Part-time? Yeah. No, there, it, I don't even call the person an SRO. The person is our community liaison officer that I've taken off, had him taken off other projects because I feel so 
you know, that, that the school needs something right now. I mean, the people, to me, this is my opinion, need to see us around, need to see this, need to, need to be able to complete the school year. Uh, there's been a lot of tragedy that has happened, whether it's been in schools or, or other places. And so I've, I've had that person go down to the high school and the middle school as much as he can get in there. So Sarah, can you grab the mic in front of you? Sorry. Sorry. So, so if we were to um, hire, let's say we got an SRO, as everyone wants, and would that person then, your community liaison person would rejoin the police force, and would that SRO person be in charge of wandering through all three schools, sort of an equal time allotments, or would they spend more time in one? How are you envisioning that? Um, I'm envisioning most of the time in the high school, and the reason being is that um, if you listen, look at statistics, that's where the problems happen. Mm -hmm. so, um, I've, I've, we've had the person in the middle school because it's, it, at this particular juncture, it's fit well. The um, um, principal and vice principal of the middle school have, have adopted it and, and run with it, and they, they absolutely love it. And I've gotten more comments from them being there. But if we get a full-time SRO, and, and this will be consultation with the new superintendent, too. You know, we just don't, you know, we have, it's a partnership. And so, but my, my thoughts are it's going to be mostly in the high school with some time in the middle school and elementary school. So I have one more quick follow-up. Um, so that community liaison person, just goes back to re regular police work. Does and helps, and, and he, he also helps fill some overtime. So that, okay, so that, that may, but I, I can't tell you, it's good. that's not a great deal, but it, it will be some overtime. Okay. <clears throat> Heather? Excuse yeah, me. Um, so to follow up a little bit, Sarah, but my understanding, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that currently the, the police officer that's in the schools now is, is a lot in the lower levels. If an SRO went in, it would be in the higher levels. But this isn't where we hope to stop, if I'm correct. There are many districts, excuse me, that have two or even three SRO officers. So I think ultimately, looking into the future and down the line, we would love to be able to get somebody to start off in the high school because that's where the need for an SRO officer is the best. Recognizing that there is a gap being left by the um, officer that's currently in the middle school to eventually maybe get a second one to fill that gap in the middle school because there is a need for that. And that's what Falmouth is doing right now. They're right. going to hire for a second one. Right. And uh, we are a little bit um, fortunate with uh, the construction or the um, layout of the middle school and the elementary school with them being joined and whatnot. Usually, if anything, um, like drill wise happens, both are both are brought into it. So I, I, I totally agree with you. Suzanne? Um, so, yes, I wanted to, to, to say again that the uh, Falmouth um, SRO officer spoke to the benefits of um, bringing in the, 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 the notion and the relationship at a very young age. So I think. Um, because if you go to school, first grade, kindergarten, and you're, and you're already used to having an SRO officer present, you develop that, that understanding that they're on your side, that they're there for you, that they're part of the school. And that carries through all your years within um, grade school, middle school, and high school. Um, so as you said, you know, when the new superintendent comes, at the point where we have an SRO officer, if we love lucky enough to have one, then that conversation will have to be um, had. Now, where is the best place for one SRO officer to begin? Right. Is it middle school? And, and who knows? I mean, that's, that's to be determined, I think, as well. Um, and then to Valerie, to your point, um, or your question about overtime, obviously I can't answer it, and Chief Williams was trying his best to answer without promising anything. But just to be clear, that any SRO officer that would be hired would go straight to the police department during the summer months. So they, they would be, you know, not on, on school grounds, presumably. That's correct. Yeah. Valerie? Um, why, I know there's this whole debate about, you know, school shootings and, and what the cause is and all that, and this idea of mental health is controversial, but 
It so when I've addressed the, this question I've asked, is, are there statistics on whether having an SRO makes a school safer? The response I got was it's not, it's not just about safety, it's about developing a relationship and students have someone to go to and all that. Why a school resource officer rather than another social worker or something like that? Because it seemed like there was a need for that expressed, that the schools need more of that sort of support. Why an SRO? If, if I get to answer that, then uh, I, mean, I think it's a multifaceted position. So you have both where you have the police department or the police officer there trying to work with the kids, their families, and, and get a trust in there. But if something does happen, the officer is also trained and has the equipment in order to respond correctly. That's the way I feel about it. But I guess my point is more from a philosophical perspective, do we really, and, and no offense to the chief, the police department, I totally respect your jobs and your place in society, but do we really want to have police officers in schools? I had police officers in my school. I did not have a good relationship with them. I don't know anyone who did. And the presence of school, of officers in the school, made it feel less safe because it made it feel like there was something to be afraid of and something to be protected from. And if there aren't solid statistics on, on SROs making schools safer, I don't know whether it's a good idea to, to do this. I don't, I'm, it seems to be more in the category of appearances that people will feel safer if there is an SRO. My concern is that more students will end up in the juvenile justice system because problems that are currently dealt with on an unofficial level between teachers and, and social workers will now be dealt with in the police department. And those matters have a far greater impact on those students down the line if they go, in, if they go to that place. Um, and in full disclosure, I'm a defense attorney, so I work <laughs> with these juveniles, I, I defend them. But, but that's, that's one of my concerns, is that a lot of the things that you see now in the juvenile justice system used to be those things that you would put in the, in the category of kids will be kids and they get into trouble sometimes. And now we see them sitting in a courtroom and talking about um, conditions of release. And so I just, I'm not convinced that this is, although it's the road that a lot of people are going down, I don't know that it's the road that we should be going down. I would just like to say something to that. And the thing I can say is that um, if, and I think the school board uh, will back me on this one, if you had heard the comments from the officer that's a school resource officer in Falmouth, and the comments that the principal made from York High School, that doesn't happen. If they have a good working relationship, uh, matter of fact, I, I think the comment from the York principal is that the school resource officer that's there is an extended arm of him and his staff and works quite well together. I'm not saying it can happen and I'm not saying that an officer might not be brought into a situation. But um, I don't think we've had those problems, and we're not that far away from the schools, I don't think we've had those problems or those issues uh, brought to our attention from the principal of the high school. John, did you want to say something? So, so I was just going to say, um, I, I came from a big city, had similar sort of experiences as you, and I uh, appreciate what you're saying and had some similar concerns. Those were greatly alleviated when I heard from the actual principals and resource officers who, who did come to speak to us. And what they explained, and I thought it was really important, was different than a social worker, they're really serving a different population, a somewhat different population that is not being reached or uh, connecting in the same way that they would to a social worker. Um, and the, in, in terms of uh, overall safety, it's a little bit hard to measure because I think it's, it's, a, it's a relatively low incidence problem. But what they did say, if I recall, was, and this is somewhat anecdotal, I don't know if there's broader research on this, but they did see a significant reduction in uh, juvenile petty crime in, uh, when they had instituted a, a school resource officer. And what that says to me is that that 
is backing up the value of what they're saying of getting into the, and developing those relationships early with people who may be headed down a, a challenging path and actually of, of avoiding some of those juvenile justice system issues. So um, it was somewhat different than I ex expected it to be based upon the, the, the people who came to talk to us. And so that was my take away from it. So um, I encourage you to watch those or invite them to come speak. Sarah? Can I ask? Jeff Shedd, what, what, what's your experience? Do kids dislike, distrust, get nervous, or do they, do they feel safer? And what's, how would that person interface with Mr. Carpenter? Um, how would you see this on the So um, I've worked in three different schools since I became an educator. Two of the three had school resource officers. Cape Elizabeth was the only one that didn't. I have had, when you get the right person for the job, and the thing that makes me think that we'll get the right person for the job is what the chief talked, it's very clear to me that he understands the kind of person that will be successful in this role. Um, I have worked with outstanding school resource officers and I've worked with a couple of people, one person in particular who was, wasn't a good fit. He was a good police officer, but he wasn't a good fit working with kids. Um, I'm confident that we would come up with a process working together where we find somebody who's a good fit. Um, for example, our community liaison officer right now is not a school resource officer. Um, he, if he were to become a school resource officer, he would make nothing but a positive difference at school. His kids love him. Um, they don't fear him. Um, they appreciate the informal, friendly demeanor with which he approaches them. Um, I appreciate the question about a social, the social worker possibility as well, I, and I certainly value the work of social workers, and we have two outstanding ones in the high school. Um, what, social, what tends to happen with social workers is because the needs are really great, is they have, tend to have to spend a lot of time with a relatively small amount of kids whereas a good school resource officer is, you know, will definitely spend some time in the office, but the value of having somebody who's just a constant, ready presence in the hallways, in the cafeteria, having lighthearted conversations, going down to the gymnasium, outside on the basketball court, you know, high-fiving kids, it's just those little things that can make a huge difference. Um, I would definitely say, based on my experience with good school resource officers, which I'm confident that we could get, that we would actually have less students having interactions with police in a negative way in school because the relationships will be developed and because um, resource officers will begin to get to know kids at an earlier age before, before there's likely to have to be some formal interventions. I, supported a school resource officer here ever since I've been here, and I'm thrilled um, um, that the school board and town council are thinking about it, and I really want to add my thanks to the chief, because he, when I called, he responded immediately, and we've had a lot of hours of the community liaison officer's time, and it has, been, it has done nothing but, one, make kids feel safer and make them feel more connected, um, and, and, and two, I think really begun to forge those relationships. I, wor I worry, the things that I worry about when people start talking about school safety and that sort of thing is when they jump to the issue of hardware and metal detectors and locking doors. Um, man, does that send a message to kids about what's safe and what's unsafe far more than having a, a friendly resource officer in school saying hi to kids and high-fiving kids. I, I'm totally strongly in favor of this, and that the, we have to be really sensitive to get the right the right person. And I have every confidence that we can do that. That's more than you asked for. But. No, thank you. That's, that's really helpful. Susanna, um, Valerie, I, I appreciate your your angle too. When I first started even thinking about this several years ago, I thought, oh, you know, I just kind of didn't like it. Thought it would be more like what you're saying, like it might. It, it, will, it will create a larger divide in us against them. But as I've come to learn and in, the, in the research that I've, I've done, um, especially with the um, evolution of the, the role of the SRO officer, um, I'm seeing that it's, it's, it's definitely much more of a preventative 
force than, than anything. And especially uh, if, if, if they are viewed and treated um, as an extension of the administration, that, that only encourages that. And as I said last night, you know, SRO officers, in addition to all their other training now, that's just going to keep growing what they have to be trained in. So they're going to become more of a, like a quasi social worker slash, you know, officer, um, because that's the, the, the demand of their job. So to your question about, you know, social worker over SRO officer, um, we need both. Um, but the good thing about a really good SRO officer with, with our sort of uh, cultural perspective in mind, I and mean, we don't, we don't, we shy away from expelling kids, you know, we, we don't feel like that's the way, the best way for kids to learn. We want them to learn from the mistakes and we want them to know that we're here for them to succeed, similar to an SRO officer. Um, so I, I think it's, you know, just an augmentation of some of the work that a social worker might do. Heather. Um, so I just offer a little antidote here because I think a lot of uh, what can happen is it's based on culture, culture of the schools. And I think in this district with these students, there is a positive culture of relationship with the community liaison. And the antidote that I use is just my daughter and her friends at the football game, they seek out the community resource officer and hang out with them. So um, they're, they're, there is that relationship built, and it is a positive one in this district. So I just thought I'd share that. I don't want to prematurely jump off of this topic, but I'm sensitive to covering the other material that we have as well. So is there anybody else that has an opinion or question that they want to weigh in? Yes, here. Yeah, in reference to this topic, I had mentioned before, and I think there's a need for it. I didn't want to get clarified. Uh, are we going to apply for the grant? And if we apply for the grant, can we use that as a second part-time uh, school officer too, or not? Do you have a need for another one? My thought about the grant is um, it, it, won't, it wouldn't be a part-time. It's for a full-time okay. officer. And it's, and it's for those grants are for replacing somebody that you're going to put in to a position. Usually that's what that's, that's for. So that's my thought about um, applying for a grant. Now, if we hire some, I, I don't know, I'm just thinking out loud here. If we hire somebody and apply for the grant, I don't know if that takes us out of the mix because we've already hired somebody. I don't know. I, I don't know how that was going to go. <clears throat> so, I, I mean, I think, uh, you know, that we're in a good position because we haven't, we've never had one. Uh, but um, I would have, you know, I would have thought with everything going on and, and whatnot that it would have rolled out before this, but it hasn't. Is there something you want to say, John? Just, just, just briefly to wrap up. Conversation. I just want um, to take us back to the when we were considered. This was actually very much the, one of the last things on the table for who were looking at our budget, and we really valued it. Um, but sort of the deciding factor was sort of hearing from the people who came to talk to us and finding out that there was a possible funding model that didn't necessarily come out of the school budget. And what we were as we were facing the final choices of what was in and what was out. Uh, that's where we came down. We really valued it, and I also want to say I, I, I personally really appreciate the, the seriousness and openness in which the town has uh, and the town council has sort of embraced looking at this as sort of what one, one, one town, and I'm very in, encouraged by that approach. So thank you. Thanks. Any other comments before we move on? Thanks, Chief Williams. Appreciate thank it. You. Thanks, Chief. Thanks for the information, Matt. Yeah, yeah, um, so the next thing. Um, do we want to move to, um, I know we've got information here that we got, uh, everybody should have about some of the capital spending. I know that, Jessica, that was something you had a particular interest in um, when we were breaking last night. Well, <clears throat> I wanted to hear a little bit more about the custodian situation. I mentioned that last night. Would this be the time sure. to do that? Yeah, that's fine. Or? If we want to keep on that, that's fine. Pardon? Go ahead. That's fine. Um, you know, it's a it's a, a listed item as a re primary reason for budget increase at sixty thousand dollars, and I was looking at the um, um, 
position proposal, and I wanted to uh, just review that. I, you know, it, as the superintendent was just mentioning, there seems to be an issue with the custodian going to the pool, and perhaps, yeah, I, I think Perry Schwartz is here. Maybe he could come up because we have your, this. This would take you to fi, uh, 16. Is that correct? Custodians. There are 15 now, and it's up to you. So, so would this position then create a total of 16 custodians? I'm looking at I'm looking at page 15 of 17 in your uh, new positions. Okay. Um, I just wanted to give a brief dis brief description of what a year in our office looks like and what and how we've gotten to the request for this position. And I've had my staff run some numbers, and in a 365-day period to this date, um, our office has dealt with 2,300 transportation runs. That's outside of the normal school bus runs every day. Um, the facility's maintenance crew of four people have completed 1,280 work orders in a total of 15 buildings that we oversee. Um, my staff has scheduled 210 reservations for Fort Williams. And the big one is we've scheduled 9,849 facility events in the past year. Those events and how our custodial staff has to work around those events is how I came to this conclusion of needing the extra position. We have a total of 14 custodians on the night shift. We also have four during the day, but our, our day shift is staffed well, so I'm kind of leaving them out of this picture. It's more focused on the 14 custodians at night and when the majority of our cleaning gets done. To write it on paper, <laughs> It's, it's simple, it can look simple. 11 school custodians and three town custodians. The three town custodians handle Richard's Community Pool, Town Hall, Thomas Memorial Library, the Community Center, and the police station. Unfortunately, it's not that simple. Out of those 14 custodians, we currently have two custodians on limited hours. Um, one works X amount of hours a day, not a full shift. Another one has one day a week off due to medical condition. We have recently, a week ago, lost a, another custodian who had suffered from a stroke last Thursday, and that has been a huge hit to us um, because without him, we're, we're really struggling. I also have a, another custodian who is going to be going out very shortly for uh, four weeks for uh, medical surgery. So when you break down the 11 custodians for the school and the three town custodians, and now you remove what we have just in, in medical leave, and now you have people that take vacations, people that call in sick, um, whatever can happen in a daily schedule, we're, we're drowning. And um, I approached the board originally for two extra custodians and a maintenance crew, uh, an extra maintenance person. Due to the budget this year and, and the difficulties of, of coming to a number, I decided that if I could just get one extra custodian, that would, it's an improvement. It's not perfection, but it's an improvement. Um, I've had custodians, uh, one off the top of my head came to our office crying one day because it was just, it's just too much. I 
take my hat off to my staff. I don't, I come in in the morning just like everybody else, 8 a.m., I walk into buildings, I have no idea how they accomplished what they did the night before. Um, so I couldn't be where I am today without the job that my staff does, all of them. Um, I want to bring some clarification to the 11 school custodians and three town custodians because it's not that simple. Originally, uh, I believe a year ago, the high school had asked for a custodian or two custodians and they received one. And the confusion came into that custodian is working in the pool. In some ways they are, but that's them as a person. After reviewing this with Janet Hoskins, who oversees the custodial staff, I got a little more clarification on how this juggling, I call it a juggling act, it's a juggling act on a unicycle. Um, what they have to do every night. This, this meeting and the schedule for this meeting is part of a juggling act. I can't say that we have the 11 custodians and the three custodians in the town buildings because it doesn't work that way. We may have one of those town custodians working in the school. Um, I'll just use Pond Cove Elementary as an example. They might be in the elementary school for three hours at the start of their shift. What happens is later on in the evening, it, the night always ends with the pool because that's just the most difficult area and to do hours and things, that's typically the last thing to clean up. Um, all the staff, or, or, or the staff required, I believe it's four people, go to the pool. We make up those hours from the person that helped out Pond Cove. They make up those hours at the pool. So it's not really, yes, the pool has four people, but it's the time. It's, it, it's a wash. Where, where we take from Peter, we give to Paul. It's, it, it's a complete, I, that's why I say you can't really go by a body count. It really should go by hours when we look at this. Just a question on funding. So, all these events you mentioned, are, are, does the school pick up the tab for people to clean up after those events, or do the people that rent the spaces, for example, if there's a meet in the pool, does that get rolled into the fees that other schools might pay? Or, more to the point, you know, we rent the pool out to a lot of these towns around here to have practice. Do, are they surcharged how much it would cost to clean up after it? You get my point. How yes. much are we? Are we paying for other people to benefit from our facilities, and can we take a look at that and maybe start charging? There, there. I can't give you the exact formula, but yes, we are covered on that. Um, we give, or, or if it's a school, not a school-related item, or or something similar to that, we do not charge for that event. If it's somebody from an outside, say, have a, a party, or um, I believe the church has something at the community center, um, there is a fee for that. So we, we are covered on those things where, where it's required. Now, Solomon, was your, did, did you, was your question answered on the actual staffing, or did you have follow-up? Well, I was going to ask one thing, and then I was going to ask something of our town manager. Sure. Uh, what would you say is the percentage of usage of our pool by the school department? High school swim meets, middle school, all that. I mean. That would be a better question for Kathy Raftis, I believe. But I would, I, from what I hear, that's all I can go on is from what I hear, the, the school does use a large portion swim team and, and things like that during okay. the school year, so yes. Thanks, and I wanted to just ask the town manager, I mean, we have, we fund three of these, do we not? We do, we do a fund transfer. Uh, we have an allocation that we set aside to, to fund for those three positions, more or less. And so, as you mentioned, uh, the three we have that you said are 
the town's custodians. So I'm a little confused, so bear with me, please. <laughs> but this has come up. I've watched the videos of the school board finance meetings, and this is you know, a recurrent theme of, of um, uh, frustration on their part. So if we have three, if we fund the hours for three of these FTEs, if you will, and we have the pool as our responsibility, uh, including the library and the police center and the community service center, if the pool is our responsibility and we fund that position, I'm, I'm unclear as to why this is causing a problem in the school building. I, I'm, I'm missing something, I know, but. The, I'm, I'm gonna say part of that is my fault. Uh, when I came to the town to present my budget, the facility's budget to the town, I was unprepared at the time to present the, the concept of another custodian with on the town side also, which would have been the two custodians that we needed. Um, that's on me. Um, the, we are short one custodian on the town side. To, to have the five buildings and the, the amount of work that the pool requires, because it, it's a, they do a full scrub down in the, in the men's and women's locker rooms, um, takes quite a while. And a lot, it's all hands on deck. Um, something that I'll be looking towards presenting next year. Um, but yeah, for this year, I just I was unprepared at the time when I presented the facilities budget to the town. And just one more question: Do we have a custodian? I mean, a lot of these issues take place at night. I mean, mm -hmm. the pool is used a great deal, um, and as you said, there's a great deal of school use by the pool, mm -hmm. which would include at night. Um, I'm sure at times, anyway. Do we have if? Supervisors. I mean, are there custodians supervising the work of others? So I, I'm just surprised that problems would rise to the level they apparently rise to. The we have lead custodians. There's one town lead custodian, one lead custodian in the middle school, and one lead in the high school. We don't consider it a supervisory position, but they handle. They kind of get the crew all together and working in the same direction when something arises. The schedule for next year, uh, and this will happen over the summer, is I will be moving a current supervisor on day shift, will be moving to a night shift position. Well, that was my next question, because if, if the problem is mostly at night, yeah. are, are, is your lead person watching the quality right. of work at night? Yeah, that, that's, that's how the system was set up when I came to Cape Elizabeth, um, I observed it over the year and decided yes, it would be more appropriate to have that person, you know, at, at least cover the majority of the night shift. So okay. I agree. Yes. Thank you. Uh, uh, I was hoping you could clarify something just for me a little bit. Uh, so the staffing sheet that we have, uh, you said 14 on the staffing sheet. It says 18.13. Um, is that like a typo, or can you explain the discrepancy? I'm not sure what the point one three is. It's, it's 18 people. Uh, so that, uh, but you were talking about 14, right? 11 for the it's, school. It's so 14 on the night shift. Got right. it. Got but, it. Got it. Right. Uh, what we have is that, <clears throat> the, that supervisor position is currently on the uh, day shift and is actually working as kind of a floater right now. And then we have a custodian in the high school and two. One, one over in middle school and one in Ponco. And I think your explanation probably answered this, but just to clarify in case I'm wrong, uh, and I realize you lack the institutional knowledge being relatively new. So when I look at the custodians we had in the school department historically, we were back at 13, 14, and then 15 for a long time. We see the jump. Is that because the school was assigned the three that are doing the town work and then we're reimbursing them? Is that why we saw that jump in headcount? I'm, I'm going to guess that jump is due strictly to the demand on uh, how active our buildings are in the evening. Um, you know, back when I went to school, I think the day pretty much wrapped up at the end of the school day and the janitors closed the doors and, and started their cleaning. Now we're looking at an environment where things are going until 10, 11 o'clock at night in the schools. And, you know, sometimes town hall, libraries open until 8.30, you know, just things of that nature. It's, there's a little bit more of a demand at night now. 
Heather? Um, I would just like to suggest that I feel like we're getting really caught in the weeds and the little details. I, I, anybody who spends time in the schools, um, the teachers, the students, um, they need help. They need support. And, and the bottom line is that we need more support there and we put a custodian into the budget. And, and, that, and that's what needs to be come across. They, they need help. They're, they're understaffed. And um, all this nitpicking of how it's being done, that's Perry's job, and he's doing a great job with it. And the fact is, is that they need, they need somebody else to help out. They need more than one person. And we're just trying to get the support in there. Whether they're in the pool or in the high school, it, it's not happening to the level that's satisfactory. And so I would encourage us not to get so caught up in the weeds and just recognize the big picture. That like, this just needs to be a part of what, of what we're doing to support our, our schools, our, our buildings, our town hall, our pool, the people who come in, our teachers who are spending their days there. I mean, and if you don't know how filthy they are, I encourage you to go look. I encourage you to walk around. I encourage you to spend some time in there because, um, I'm not going to say details of what I've seen, but go spend some time and see it for yourself instead of getting caught into the weeds here. There's a lot to cover, and, and, the, and there's just this fact that it needs to happen. It, it's sanitary. It, it's, so I just encourage us to move on and, and to recognize that Perry's needs are really valid and that he actually needs more than one, but he was willing to compromise. And the fact that... They, uh, custodians have been mean, heard these over the years in the conversations. Custodians get sick and there's no backup. It's the same thing with our bus drivers. There, there's no leeway and, and um, so anyway, that's what I do. So. Other comments? Just quickly. John? So, uh, Chris, I think what you might be seeing is the one year community services was under the school's ah. budget and shifted over. I think with that what you're seeing is an anomaly. The work really hasn't changed. We've been understaffed for some time. Any other questions on this item? Perry, thank you very much. Thank Appreciate you. it. Did you work with the CIP? Uh, yes. Um, yeah, actually, Perry, before before you leave. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, Jessica, another area that you had brought up last night that you want to do um, dig in deeper on today was um, what I was starting to talk about before. Um, sort of the reporting of status on some of the capital spending, capital improvement spending, as well as specifically some of the um, uh, uh, initiatives that fell under um, bonding. So um, we should all have supplemental materials that got handed out um, before the meeting. Um, I'm not sure. Catherine, if you want to take the lead on this to start, or Perry, or Jessica, if you just have questions you want to jump into, um, well, I'm happy to go in any direction. I saw, I mean, I, we, we just got some handouts tonight, um, and I was very glad to see those. I brought my <clears throat> school uh, capital stewardship planning notebook that the school department put together in 2015, and it's a to 2024, um, and so um, I've been asking for an update of, of their uh, CIP, and so it was good to see these documents tonight. Um, it looks as if from, and I, you know, we just got them, so, and I, I did bring my notebook and I had gone through that, but it looks like, it looks as if, and Catherine, I, what I, ask you this or Howard or well it, it does look as if from this document right here that sh that you have essentially expended that for which we bonded is that correct mm -hmm. that is okay correct. Yeah. yeah because you know that's one of the things I've been asking and we weren't sure on that I guess so this is good and then this this document <clears throat> that we just got is the the breakdown this the uh, larger six-page document is actually a listing of a lot of um, major capital improvement projects over um, the last 
four years or so. It's not just the bonded. You'll notice as you go through okay. under the description, it will say 2015 bond. There's only okay. like four items, four or five, four or five items that are at the actual bond. Okay. I mean, we, we all just got this, so we yes. haven't had a chance to look at it. Um, so, so thank you for that. Um, I mean, I will, I'll go through it, but thank you very much because that, that's important, particularly given what, you know, you may be requesting. I do have a question about uh, the, the CIP in general, mm -hmm. your fund. Uh, are you, what are you funding? I was not able to find this in the budget. Maybe it's in the appropriation master part and I couldn't find it, but what of your budget projected for 19 are you funding for your CIP? I, I couldn't find it. Under the facilities and transportation tab of your binder, mm -hmm. there is in there a whole list. It's actually page nine. Is this the $449,000 list? It's, uh, it's oh, updated right about that. yesterday. You got another sheet that was updated, and the total is now $634,110. So, all right, what, what page again? I want to make sure I'm looking at the page, same thing. Page nine of your, of the facilities tab of the binder. Okay. It was updated yesterday. And it was updated yesterday. It was updated yesterday, and what sheet is that on? It should be. It was one of the individual. The one we just got? Page nine. No, from yesterday. Oh, from yesterday, okay. There were, there were four pages, or um, one of yesterday's hand three in a stapled pack yesterday. The stapled one was the answers to Chris's question. Okay. But it's the same page numbering of 9 to 15, and it has um, photos of the school in the back. Okay. Of it. It, was, okay. it was designed to pull out the uh, old page and just put it put back in the new page. So what's the updated figure? The updated figure is $634,110. And it does give you a whole list of items that are um, are recommended by the facilities department. Right. And so, what my question is, I see this as capital improvement recommendations, but is is that in fact what you are funding to complete for fiscal year 19? Yes. So, in your current budget. The, or the projected budget. budget for 19. Yes. You are planning to spend $634,000, $634,110 for these items. Yes. Thanks. That, that's all I wanted to know. Okay. Are there questions that anybody has on items related to capital improvement or both for planned projects as well as the information on the past completed projects? Okay. Um, other questions? I think I think that's the three main areas. Excuse me. Oh, yep. Oh, that's right. Thank you. And Noel's here. Thank you very much. So yesterday, um, Valerie, you had brought up some questions around um, technology, the leasing, um, and so Noel Harris here. Uh, thanks very much for being here, Noel. Thanks, Howard. Do you want to repose your questions or just? Sure. Um, yeah. So um, one of my questions, I guess it was a broader discussion we ended up having, but about the iPads and whether um, this is the, the lease program is the best way to approach this and whether there might be more cost effective ways to do this as we move forward. Um, so that was sort of one general discussion we had. And then the other question was specific to the proposed um, I think it was six projectors at Pond Cove and the sound system and the necessity for that and what currently exists. <coughs> Excuse me. Projectors at Pond Cove. Before you get rolling, uh, it's just, it's just only, um, may I just add to some things you brought up that also maybe that Noel could address? I think one of them you also talked about was um, what about, or someone did, raise the question about what about us having students bring their own uh, devices. That was a question, I think. And, um, gosh, there was another one. Wi Fi. Wi -fi. What's, I'm sorry, the Wi Fi. Wi -Fi. Oh, we got the right one. That was another one. But I also, it was the, 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 top, the type of device. Right. As and well, the correct. Projector so you have one hour. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 
Um, so I'll try and be direct. And, and what we do um, with our equipment, we're talking about long range, um, one of the citizens came up and talked about long range, is the fact that uh, what we do is we get our equipment at the high school. And then after the high school goes through their use of it, it fills, filters down to the middle school and Pond Cove. So, you know, we're not really, I guess, we're not really paying for stuff at Pond Cove and at, at uh, the middle school because we're reusing the equipment to go down. So that's one reason why um, there's a big number at the high school. Um, so as far as leasing is involved, um, I personally do not like leasing technology equipment. Um, I think it's not uh, very uh, pound foolish um, per se. Um, but unfortunately, with the budget constraints and trying to be conservative and, and, and in that respect and keeping costs at a minimum, it's really the only way to do that. Um, the current lease that we have with Apple is a 0% finance lease um, for three years. Um, of course, they probably, just like Subaru and everybody else, puts a little bit of money in to recoup that. They're in business to do something. Um, so that explains that part. Um, Wi-Fi, um, in 19, in, uh, this year really is the last time Milky is really taking care of our Wi-Fi. Um, they are, like, if we have a spot, when we first put the Wi-Fi in with the Milty program, it was based on, you know, we're going to put it here, put it there for coverage. And what has happened over the last three or four years is it's not coverage anymore. It's the amount of devices in the classroom. And so even though that we have this Wi-Fi here, and it, what, at that time was okay with coverage, we're now having, you know, you know 23, 24 computers just for the for those children in, but then we have the staff having it, and plus everybody bringing an iPhone, so on and so forth. And so um, they're getting out of the Wi-Fi, um, the multi-program is getting out of the Wi-Fi um, business, and so we have to make a plan of, of how we're going to replace that and take control of that. So Wi-Fi, oh, whiteboards, I'm sorry. Um, those whiteboards are replacing chalkboards. Sorry, it wasn't um, the oh, whiteboards, okay. it was the, there was an item in here, six projectors. Short throw. Short, short throw, throw projectors short, with sound systems. Right, so short uh, throw projectors, okay. So what the, what the staff at uh, Pond Cove is proposing to do is to have short throw projectors using whiteboards instead of the, replace the chalkboards and put whiteboards so that they can manipulate, um, you know, doing math problems and so on and so forth with the short throw. It doesn't throw a, a, a shadow onto the board. It's a lot clearer to see. Um, so, and really, the expense compared to a long throw in the middle of the room, you know, we'd have to put electricity up there and so on and so forth to do that. So it's not that much of an uh, increase. If you look at, like, what we have here, right? I have to run a pipe, and I have to run wires down to here and so on and so forth. In the short throw, you really don't have to do all that work. So currently, what do they have? Oh, just a chalkboard? They just have chalkboards, and there are very few projectors. We're starting to, again, bring some of the um, Apple TVs that are you know, first generations and second generations down from the, from the high school to, to populate that. So when they do Apple Classroom, and, and they have all that, um, and they want to bring a, a, ch a child up to or a child to uh, reflect their work, they can call on it and use Apple Classroom to project it up. Yes. Quick question. Uh, my recollection with my kids going through Pond Cove is there are a number of smart boards. Are those still being used? Or no, is the this smart boards are not, uh, are antiquated. Oh, okay. Okay, right. unfortunately. Um, and it's another thing that the trend for, for uh, smart boards are pretty, as you, if you look at the statistics and stuff like that, and using the smart boards in the schools have dramatically gone down. And I think we had some discussion last night around, as Howard said, um, notion of advantages or disadvantages of any kind of bring your own device program or um, some of maybe the complexities of switching platforms from one, um, one hardware and operating system 
to another or having multiple different ones in in operation at the same time? Can you speak to some of those challenges or like well, I said, sort of the pros and cons? Well, there really is, you know, we, we went over, over the list um, of what the pros and cons and the one pro that sticks out, of course, is is the dollars, right? And, you know, you're not investing very much in the um, in the equipment and stuff like that. But the negatives are creativity, the negatives of having um, the same device that a teacher can rely on in the classroom, um, the negativity about being able to make sure that all devices are learning devices. We completely close those down. So not only do we have a filter on our web usage and stuff at school, but we also have a um, a way using our um, management device management uh, system to say you can only have these X amount of um, applications on that. Um, right now as we speak, if you go to the Google plat um, platform like the Chrome, they have a, a store called Google Play and unfortunately there's really no way to lock that down as we speak right now. And of course, um, Google really doesn't have any incentive to lock it down. Um, so. As a management device and as a learning device, okay, as we speak right now, there is some advantages to continuing to use the app, um, iPad, um, using going to um, even a, a, a Apple laptop, okay, which is a very expensive um, item to do. There's really no way to lock down out to make them less um, not administrators of the device, so that causes problems and stuff like that. So basically, what you what we're trying to do is just like everybody having the same textbooks as we start a class, we're having the same device, you know, and it makes it a lot easier, just like having the same number two pencil um, in the days of old. I had asked the question yesterday, I don't know if you're in a position to know the answer to this or not, but are you aware of, you know, maybe colleagues in, in the industry in other towns, do you know of other towns that um, have any sort of um, technology user fee or anything like that? Um, I don't. Uh, I don't think there's anyone that has any user free. Um, I could ask that question. Um, we meet months a month with all the technology uh, coordinators for the state of Maine. We have a group, um, but I don't believe there is. Um, we did at one time have a, a policy to um, collect insurance fees um, and so on and so forth. But that's also a struggle too because you know a four man shop trying to. <laughs> do uh, collection of fees and making sure and chasing the children. And then the other thing is, do you make a decision on, well, they didn't pay the fee, you know, we don't give them the device. And then the teacher saying, well, if, you know, if only half my students have devices, why use them? You know, I, I'm in the same problem as bring your own, own device and so on and so forth. So it's, a, it's not an easy proposition. We have gone through that before. Thanks. Valley? Yes, ma'am. Um, if there was, so one of the things we talked about last night is, or I brought up is the, that students are required to, to get their own calculator, the graphing calculator and bring that. Um, if there was a similar approach to the computers, say every student had to have an iPad Air and bring that with them, um, would the school have the ability, and I guess this maybe gets into some legal questions, would there be a way for the school to lock down the devices while the kids are in school so that they weren't accessing other things? They're not really our devices, so I don't think so, but that's, you would know a little bit more than me. But the other thing about that, <laughs> as far as, as, you know, again, you know, what happens is after the, 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 the iPad or whatever device happens in the, in, the, in the high school, we bring that down. We bring that down to sixth grade all the way to kindergarten, for example. You know, in kindergarten, first grade, and second grade, they don't need the latest and greatest device, okay? But, we, you know, we have eight-year-old iPads working in first and second grade right now. So it's not like, you know, it's great to bring your own device and so on and so forth, but then we'd have to find some way to fund the lower grades, you know? And so that's one advantage of doing it what we're doing now. Any other questions for Noel on technology? No? Thank you so much. Okay. Appreciate Thank it. Thank you. Jessica. There, there was one more thing I... Not in, not in technology. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, before you proceed with the rest of the agenda, I had mentioned also last night that I wanted to address the funding feasibility engineering sure. and RTEC fees 
So would this be the time Please. to do that? So this is uh, one of the reasons for budget increase on the list. It's uh, $249,350 for feasibility, a full feasibility study for uh, what we've learned is a preliminary consideration for a 27 to $28 million bond. And I would like to ask the school board if there would be any consideration to waiting a year for this perhaps, and let me explain why I had this thought. Uh, there's not a great deal known about this. You know, this is, it sounds like a huge project. We, a couple of us counselors went to a tour of the schools. Uh, not everybody was able to go. It was January 30, I believe. We had, uh, we sat in on a presentation by uh, Colby, I guess it was Col Colby Engineers. And you've expended, I saw already, $29,000 for that, that presentation and the booklet and everything, I think, or the work up to that point has been $29,000. Uh, this is such a huge amount that you're talking about. I'd like to draw a couple parallels uh, one of my concerns is that, again, it's huge. We've heard a couple citizens speak in the last two weeks about, gee, can the town really afford this? Um, how is this being vetted? When we went through the library process, we had a citizen planning committee. After we lost the first bond, uh, we went back to the drawing board. We got a citizen committee. We expended not very much with architects, and we worked for a year to come up with a project that Everybody, you know, everybody had participated in. Essentially, we had a lot of community input with the Solid Waste Recycling Committee, uh, with the uh, Recycling Center, Transfer Center. Same thing. Citizen Committee expended very little. Spent a year. Well, it wasn't quite a year. That was a faster committee. But my my point is, I think there are things that you're looking at that are very important. There are things that I scratch my head at. But my point is. People, we're, we really don't know um, a lot about this, and I think anything of this magnitude requires uh, significant community input. And so my, my question, my thought is, would you consider waiting a year and perhaps putting together a citizen committee, looking at everything that you're you know, wanting, um, and just to backtrack, with the library, ultimately, that was $4 million that we bonded for that. Um, and again, we had a full year planning committee, a citizen committee. The solid waste and recycling ended up being $5 million, and you're looking at 27 to 28. So that's recycling my concern. 27? 1. 1. 1. 1.5, not 5, for the recycling center. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. yeah 1.5. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I think I need more coffee or regular. One of our, um, one of so our anyway, original the, concepts, I think, was five million. Yeah. <laughs> we, we pared that down quite a bit. Yeah. So anyway, that's what, you know, I mean, it's, it's a, you know, a big budget uh, item that you have here. And I, I think that, again, there are things that you're looking at that are, I think, are very important that I, w that I would very much like to support. But I think it's such a huge number. I'm, I'm wondering if you wouldn't consider taking that out of your budget and regrouping and planning perhaps to come back in a year. In the meantime, have garnered a citizen committee, with, including school board people. I mean, it just this is a lot. And uh, this way, you, you might come up with something that could be uh, embraced by the majority of the, of the town. Um, anyway, that, that's what I wanted to say. Elizabeth? Up. Uh, so, uh, I'm glad you brought that up. This is actually one of the questions that I had in my, that I sent in previously that I got an answer on. Um, the aspect of it that I found persuasive, because I had uh, many of the thoughts you had, is um, there's a waiting list with the state uh, to get, instead of us paying for it, the state to pay for this project. But it, my understanding is in order to help us on that waiting list to get the state to pay for it instead of the local taxpayers, uh, it greatly aids us, and this was the answer where I was looking for, um, it greatly aids us if we have this initial material as part of our submission packet. So what I see it as is we'll put forward this 250 now, and I hear everything you're saying, but it doesn't mean we have to then build the project immediately. We can wait a couple years to build the project. I know many people might want to start it now, but 
it doesn't bind us to start the project immediately, but it does get us on that list. So we have a shot at the money from the state, so. Go ahead, Jessica. Well, even if, we, even if that were to be the, the road, that's, that is so much more money than what we expended for other projects for this initial look at, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't know. That's, that would be my only yeah, concern. I, I hear I you. Mean, but. Elizabeth. So I'm in no position to answer would the board be willing to do anything. Um, I, what I would like to um, put out there for you and for the public is that I don't think anybody knows what the, the, the size of the bond will be. And so to, to keep putting a number on it is, I think, irresponsible. Because we got this proposal, and I saw things in there that I thought, it, it's, it's, that's not necessarily where we're going. This is what the architects came back and said, this is important, and this would be nice, and whatever. And I'm going to go out on a limb and say, I don't think we're going to have a field house. <laughs> and that's okay. Maybe you're scratching your head. I'm scratching my head. But do we need to have safe and secure buildings where the main offices are up front? And you know that sort of stuff. So to say that 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 this you know this very preliminary you know booklet and study that the school board was presented with is what we're going forward with is absolutely not the case. It's the it was the first blush, and that I mean that could be misunderstanding. Um, I was not on buildings and grounds. I don't. But for me, the reason why we need this study is so that we know what the actual real safety, health, and um, accessibility needs are. And, you know, I don't know that, you know, an amphitheater out in the back of the high school makes the list. And so we, we need to, you know, be careful about saying, like, that's what it is. Well, because I don't think that's what I could be wrong. Sorry, through the, through the finance chair. I would agree with you, but that is what has been promoted. That's what has been published. That's what people are reading in the paper. So, you know, I, I see your point, but what, how else, what else would I, what else would I think? That's what I've been reading. I agree. Okay. I agree. Um, you've talked a lot about comparing the library project and the, the, re the recycling center project. Can somebody from the school board maybe apples to apples for me, what are you going to get for the quarter million dollars compared to what we got for those projects? I mean, if we're getting, are you getting full draw, like, what exactly is that price tag buying us? It, you know, is it more and above, you know, so we can, you know, alleviate the concerns? I'm just curious, what exactly are they going to do? And I, and I don't know, is this more like what we're going to talk about on Monday? So we really don't need to hash it all out now. I'm, I, I'm not sure what Monday's conversation is versus what this conversation, if we should just wait and do it all on Monday. But I'd be more curious if we're getting a lot more for our, our this amount than what we got for the library, then, then this amount makes sense. But then if not, then maybe Jessica's concerns are a little more valid. So I'm not sure where that conversation leads, but I'll leave that to you. Go ahead, Howard. So, um, do you have copies of what you worked up in terms of the process? Oh, I it, it partially answers. I didn't bring any with me. Sorry. Okay, well, maybe you can make that available. Yes. But thank you. But um, let me so I try and answer a few things. Um, let, let me see. Go back and order. I'll, I'll get to your question. Mm -hmm. So, regarding the community committee, um, I think that's essential, and I think that we on the, on this pro project, if there were ten steps to take from the beginning to the end, we're at step one. We aren't any further along than we've gone this far. We've selected a, a, a group of architects and engineers to work with. That's what we've done. And they have done some preliminary review of priorities that we identified they didn't. And they have thought about those priorities and given us some alternatives for to address them. And that's as far as we've gone. And they are saying that if we were to do these various things that have been identified, we think that 
the ballpark cost of that would be this amount of money, the amount of money that we're talking about today. There are things that are on the preliminary list that won't make the final list. There's some things that we don't even know about today that will probably be discussed and may be added to that list. Um, so that, 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 that number is very general and very preliminary. And some of us met today with the architects and engineers that they wanted to be prepared for the presentation they're doing next Monday night, the 30th. And they, we were talking about, we being some school board members, myself, Perry, um, Catherine, about it would be really important that this have, this work going forward has a representative committee to work with them. And by that, we mean community members, town council, school board, administration, teachers, a real mixture of the total community to work with them and talk with them and raise questions. It, it was not meant to be um, done uh, in secret or without the input and wisdom of the larger community. So that idea is already out there and everybody at the table today agreed there needs to be that committee. So I want you to be assured that if this project does go forward or when it goes forward, it's only going to be a good project if a lot of people have been involved and there have been plenty of public presentations to present various stages of development where people can come and the public can weigh in and, and, and offer their input. With respect to um, the idea of a, going for a state-funded project, I've done state-funded projects. Um, I've done many, many more local-funded school projects. And I can tell you, unless things have changed, and they may have changed, that you're, as the gentleman said earlier tonight about comparing Callus with Cape, believe me, that's analogous to getting on the list for a state-funded project. You are kidding yourselves if you think that you're gonna be on the short list for a state-funded project. That's called a dream. <laughs> and you're gonna have to decide that if you're gonna do a project, that you're gonna pay for it. Because I'm here to tell you, you're paying for it. There are schools that are, are on that list that would feel blessed to have the school conditions you have here right now. Seriously. And so, there's no harm in getting on the list, but you need to understand, again, unless these have changed, and they may have since I've done one, that list changes every year. So you may get, say they fund $100 million of, of work in one year, and you, all these schools apply for that money, and you're the cutoff, they, they, they go by order, and the first project costs X million, and next X million, and when they get to hit 100 million done, that's the cutoff. Everybody that's not on that list that made the list, next year it's a re reorgan, restack, valuing of need. So you might have been the next one, you were just one shy of making that list, but next year, more places like Callis came on the list and you're now number 44. And the next year, the same thing. So I'm just trying to really not have you um, be overly encouraged by the idea that this is gonna be paid for by the state of Maine. Now regarding your point, ma'am, about um, the, what do we get for this amount of money? I, I think that what they were asking for the architects initially was around 750,000. I'm just rounding it off, but say 750. And what we were gonna get for that, apparently they're saying we, we, we get, get what that would have, they would have charged for that on a front load of, of two hundred and say fifty thousand dollars. Now the other the other the balance of that would be money if the what, if the project is ever approved, whatever that project is by the voters, that difference that they didn't get up front would be rolled into it as an expense of the of the total project to be bonded. If the project was never bonded, they eat it. And we were never asked to reimburse them for that money that was not paid. So for that 
$250,000, I think what you get it are um, a, they, they start working with your building committee. They come and visit and meet with teachers in all the schools. They bring in a team of people and they go through each building with a fine tooth comb. They um, start drawing up some, they, you know, in meeting with this committee, they start getting some priorities and start doing some concept designs. And they do public presentations and explain what's going on along the way. And then at some point they um, feel they've got a general idea, they start doing more detailed concept designs and then they have somebody, um, third party, do a cost estimate of what that project is so that's independent of them and these are just people who make a living doing cost estimates. And, the, and you get that. Then I think you get um, pro the detailed bidding specs that would, would be sent out um, for contractors to, to consider putting in a, a, a bid. And uh, uh, all the, the detailed work, the public meetings, um, I, 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 think, I think that what I've listed is a lot of what you get. It, it isn't all of their work, obviously there's all the work that goes beyond that. Once the project is bonded and you've hired an architect, I, I'm sorry, a contractor to, to, for the project, but that I think is what you get for the 250. Sarah? So, picking Can you use the mic, Sarah? Sorry. It, works. it does, you just have to talk into it. <laughs> Um, I feel like this is a great conversation and maybe should be a longer conversation wrapped into Monday night. Um, sure. Because picking up on what Jessica said and remembering the whole library process, um, honestly, the first round, we did exactly what you're describing. We hired outside people, we came in, they, we paid them, they were in charge of doing like, um, mm -hmm. I forget, meetings where you study and you hear what people think and so forth and whatnot. They even did sketches. and. It really didn't go well. Um, it ended up at the $8 million one, and people were um, discontent, not only with the price tag, but with the designs they came up with and the general concept. They felt like they didn't understand CAPE. So we spent a lot of money up front on that. And then we kind of like said, OK, we need to go back to the drawing board. And then we did it very organically within the CAPE community, yep. just in a much more inform, not inf informal, but, but totally CAPE run. Right. It was very structured. It was, it was very structured, but it was very like, no, no, we didn't have consulting groups helping us. And it took the better part of a year, but people were really happy finally with the outcome. They would buy in from all groups. It ended up with half the price tag. People were, were thrilled with the design. So I'm not saying this is apples and apples, but what I'm suggesting, and I, again, I feel like Monday night is a better time to discuss it, but perhaps you could use that firm more efficiently if your building committee or the new committee you're going to form with the various stakeholders do some upfront work first, like hold their own meetings, talk to people, what do you want, what do you think we need, what do we want to throw out, what do we want to keep in. Then you bring in the consultant and it's much more efficient and focused yeah. for what you're paying them for. It's just a suggestion. Yeah. So I, I want to get to other comments, but I wanted to jump in because at the last time we um, met, not yesterday, but the uh, previous meeting, whenever it was on the 12th. Um, the meeting that we're referencing for Monday was something that I had made comment about and was desirous of having. What, what I specifically wanted to talk more about, because I, I felt we hadn't talked enough about it previously, were the elements that were in the initial and preliminary review that's been referenced here tonight um, that went directly to questions of safety, questions of infrastructure. Um, so, the, for example, the um, installation of a generator at the middle school or some of the wiring and things like that. Some of the um, um, well, I'll just leave it at that. Safety and infrastructure. Okay. So that's what I would, I just wanted to make sure we had a more um, thorough discussion about um, to understand you know, what, it, what at least in my mind I consider to be higher magnitude of priority items, you know, and I think Elizabeth's comments sort of fall in line with that. 
Um, so that's the purpose of the the primary purpose of Monday's meeting. That's right. I'm sure that some of these other things will bleed into that, so that's fine. Um, but I just wanted to clear that up. Valerie, you had a question or a comment to make. I was just going to say I have a I have a number of questions, but I was going to say should I just hold off until Monday because I think a lot of people have a lot of questions and we have other stuff to discuss. So should we? wait until Monday to get into all of that? Um, I think, you know, since we do have this additional meeting specific to this, unless there were, you know, Jessica, you're the one that brought up the topic in general. So, um, I mean, I, 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 am, I, I guess I am just interested brief, relatively briefly to hear, I mean, the core question you asked was, at the outset was, has there been any thought about just the overall timing on this? And I don't know if, if there's a, a short answer the school board wanted to give it this time, or not at all. I'm not. I'm not putting you on the spot to do that. But well, well, they, you know, they they may not have, but I. That's what I wanted to ask. They would. No, that's what I'm saying. That. You asked the question, and we haven't really spoken to or or answered that core question. And if we talk about it Monday, that's fine. If you don't want to talk about it tonight, but Caitlin, what was? I was just going to ask. I mean, even if we push it a year, it's not going away. Right. I mean, it's still then going to be in the 1920 budget, which could be worse than. I'm not saying that this budget is worse, but I'm saying it, it, the situation could be less pleasant than we're in right now, and we've pushed it. I mean, and also just because we put it in the budget doesn't mean you need to turn around in August and and start writing this check. You could get this committee going, and eight months down the road, have had your committee meetings and have be in a more comfortable position and then you want to go and get the ball rolling and hire, you know, and, and put this into play and it had been in the budget. I'm just saying, basically, you're just going to kick the can down the road if you push it to next year's budget. Am I right in that assumption? Well, so, yeah, I mean, back to, I, I, I'm, it would surprise me if the, the board and superintendent hadn't had some discussion around just the overall timing here. So if there's any initial answer you wanted to give to that specific question, if not, we can just pick this up on Monday. Uh, I'll, yeah, I'll speak to that briefly. Because <clears throat> when this initially came around, the number was not 250. The number we were staring at was 750,000. We were looking at the state cuts of 900,000, and that number is 750. And we we're just saying, as much as we think it's the right thing to do, and we do, because like you said, those problems are not a lot of these big problems in there, and that, it's not a perfect list. But a lot of the big problems aren't going away. They're only going to get worse. The chance that bond money is going to get more expensive continues, I think, to go up. Um, and so we went and back and asked uh, the engineering firm to sharpen their pencil and see what they could do. And they came back with what we thought was an extraordinary offer, that they would put $500,000 of their potential fee at risk with the bond project. And at that, at that point, we thought, um, we don't know if this is going to come around again. We think they've done a really good job to date. And um, the, my recollection, because the conversation of the board is, we really need to do this, and so we put it in the budget at that point in time. No, Heather? Um, I think we have thought long and hard about the timing, and I think we have come to the conclusion that, as Caitlin said, it, the need has been there for a long time, and um, it's just kicking it down the road a little bit. We have this amazing uh, proposal and I want to speak a little bit to the, to the comment about the library. Uh, and, I, and I hear that very loud and clear. And I think in some ways that's a fair question. And in other ways, I, I, I think it's a totally unfair comparison. I, I don't know much about the library renovation. So correct me if I'm wrong. But I think it's a new building. Like, they're not, it wasn't, the, the, just for example, what we're proposing is not to, strip down a part of the, the schools and what does everybody want, how do they want it to look, what needs to be there, what's going in, and let's get the input, not that input's not good, that's not what I'm trying to say, but let's get the input to see how do we want to create this library. What we're saying is that we have these very specific needs. For example, the entryway to the school. For example, the access to food getting into the, to the kitchen area instead of going all the way through where the students are. These are very um, very concrete, specific, clear, exact needs. 
um, that yes, we will certainly take the input that, um, with community members. We were at the very preliminary stages of this, and to, to get the support on the specs and how to do everything, it's gonna cost us money and cooperation from these professionals that know what they're doing. It's not like we're trying to create a new design. What we're trying to do is use their expertise on what they know to create a safe, very specific environment. So in that way, I don't know if I articulated that way that well, but I feel like it's a very different situation than the library, myself. This here, and then Chris. And yeah, Jamie, um, this did not fall on the sky on us. This process, this time, Howard had explained that it was an involved process. Uh, so this did not come overnight. Short answer is to uh, uh, Jessica's question. No, we did not want to support this project at 700,000. Uh, 700, Absolutely not. Most of us were saying, wait a minute, we have a crisis, we have issues, we're not going to entertain this. How are we now to seek out more information? And the price came back at 250 or 249. So the answer is no at the higher price, definitely yes to the lower price. We're not going to get this opportunity again. And we cannot go backwards one more year to do the whole process again. Uh, so I, I just wanted to comment on something that John made, which is actually something I hadn't considered, uh, I'm embarrassed to say, but is actually a phenomenally good point. If we put this off a year and interest raised r rates rise, we are at a historically low rate. If interest rates rise approximately 1% by next year, over the lifetime of this proposed bond, obviously the numbers are out there, we could be looking at $600,000 additional cost simply because we waited a year. So it's an example of, at least for me, um, if we're gonna borrow money, now is the time to do it. I'm not saying we should borrow the money, but if this is the initial step, and I still think because of the security aspects, it might put us higher. I hear everything you're saying about don't get your hopes up, but with the security aspect, I keep thinking that might move us up the list, at least for that portion. But that interest rate point is key. We are a historically low rate, so. Jessica? Uh, you're saying $600,000 would be the would you say that again? Oh, oh, uh, I just did a rough calculation. It could be wrong. I did the, I, whatever n uh, number, ran, ran it out over the 30 year period and then said if we pay an additional uh, Based on what? On, on the full borrowing amount, yes. And it would be. But, uh, but how much? I, I thought the number was 28 million. Was that what okay. we were talking okay. about? Okay, that's so what I was. I took the 28, I did 1% additional, I ran it out over 30 years and then said if I take that amount, combine over 30 years, we'd end up paying 600,000 more in interest potentially. So. Susanna. Um, uh, so I'm just trying to, I kind of forgot what I was gonna say. But, um, to the point of timing uh, and how Howard said, you know, we're at, if, if there are 10 steps, we're at step one. Um, to the point of wanting to start now with this amazing offer at 250, it, it makes sense. We don't know if that's gonna come back. Um, but so, so in terms of the, the timing, Now's a pretty good time to start this process, given that that deal, um, because it's it's not going away. To Caitlin's question, and I, I, I'm not sure if it was thoroughly uh, answered in your mind, and Perry, please correct me if I'm wrong. But in terms of what do we get for this for this amount of money, the 250, you know, especially if we the bond fails and they take the, the loss, we we get a complete thorough study of all our buildings. This has never happened before. The study with Harriman was, was just superficial. It was just more about like what needs to be replaced. This would be a very thorough nuts and bolts study and, and, and drawings to, to use in any projects going forward. So I, I just want to make sure that that's clear. That this, this is more than just consulting. This is more than just you know getting opinions. It, is, it, is, it will eventually be a plan that we can use to, to contract. So I didn't, I wasn't involved in anything with the library, but speaking to my experience on the um, recycling project, what I'm assuming and would ask Perry or anybody else to just uh, refute if it's not correct, you know, we had a budget of 75,000 for the recycling center project, am I right? I think, sure. Andy, do you remember? That's what I. That's what I recall. But. I think it was seventy-five. So anyway, the seventy-five thousand got us all of the 
the study by the engineering firm, all of the endless renderings that we came up with before we finally landed on a single recommendation. Right. And then that was what was used to bring forward to make the proposal, and then ultimately what was used to then go bid out for the project. I, I assume that's roughly what we're talking about here, and that the scale of it is quite a bit different because unlike the library or the recycling center, you're talking about three buildings, not one site. You're talking about much larger buildings with much more extensive potential work. And I remember asking a question at one of the school board meetings that I attended to say this number that goes into this upfront fee, I assume is somewhat a percentage or predicate to you know what's what's deemed in in or outside of the scope of work so that's that's my understanding of what is. what this fee and what what this um, investment would would deliver for us so um, Sarah I was just going to suggest in the interest of time um, and people's exhaustion level, given this is the second long meeting, why don't we um, continue this discussion on Monday night? Um, and it can be part and parcel of what's going to be more of a focus of what you were talking about, because it seems like a pretty big discussion. And then we, already, we still have two more topics, plus the, the finance committee has to talk. So I think we should keep going. And I was just going to suggest or propose maybe we should hear from SELT before we go to the property, oh, because these that. poor. Yep. Folks have been sitting here for a few, <laughs> a couple hours listening to things that, that so, has nothing to do with them. Um, I'll get to that in a second, but thank you. Um, so before we move off of, I, w I just want to make sure that if there are other things specific to the material in the school board presentation that people have questions on tonight, perhaps other than the renovation project, um, I want to make sure that people have the chance to ask those. And I'm, Sarah, respectful of the time, but also understanding of the importance of the work. So. John. So I, I just want to wrap up the last bit on the project before Monday night because I wanted to. So I wanted to just echo, we agree with you. We think that the community support and knowledge and transparency and visibility on this is critical to its success. There's just no, we, we couldn't agree more. Um, the challenge is, you know, you talked about if did we think about waiting. Um, yes, we did. And the, um, the, the trade-off is, if we wait, it could be much more expensive. Right now, you, your, your project at the recycling center, that was about 5% of your 1.5 million costs, okay? So we're looking at something north of 20 million. 5% of that's about a million. And we're looking at a quarter of that and for something that may be more than that. And what you get is the full set of engineering drawings that will be necessary to take it through to that bond, because they're not going to invest 250 unless they think they can get the other piece of it in the bond issue. So it'll take you all the way through to all of the engineering drawings and cost estimates that would allow for a bond to happen. So that's what you're getting. Um, so I would encourage people to come Monday night and listen Monday night. I would find it particularly persuasive when they talked about where we are in the life of those buildings and what you need to do to get full value out of the buildings and assets that you have and what that looks like. Um, so we agree with you. Community support is finally important. Um, I was in San Francisco in the Bay Area when they rebuilt the section of the Bay Bridge and there was a lot of, of back and forth around that and the governor stopped the, stopped the project and they waited about five years and steel prices went up about two billion dollars. So um, waiting sometimes can be costly. Um, so just, you know, that doesn't mean that's not, that, that wasn't the right thing to do. I think in the end they got it right and they paid and they got the buy-in. But it, waiting is not always cost free. Um, and we were mindful of that as we put, put this forward. But we, st we totally agree getting the right community support buy-in is critical to this. Susanna? I just want to add something since you're, we're going to, uh, you're going to divert to other issues soon. Um, just to just sort of say that I, I, I've heard some of the takeaways from last night and tonight. And I, I just want to emphasize that what I've heard um, is and it's something I totally agree with, this so I'm bringing it up, that there needs to be a, a new paradigm at play where we have longer term um, planning 
and uh, I, I couldn't agree more with that. And I, I want to say that you know the day after the referendum, no matter how we land, is when we should start meeting. And at the town charter, I think it's open to um, to uh, what's the word to interpretation. The town charter, but if the town charter, as it's written, says we cannot meet, we need to change change the town charter. We need to meet as soon as we can because this is a one town. That's the other takeaway from from these two days. Any other questions, comments on the budget material? Okay. So um, I want to thank you all for your participation. It's appreciated. Thank you again, uh, as I mentioned last night, for the work that went into preparing the material. Um, it's very useful and helpful, so thank you so much. Um, you all are either welcome to stay or not. If you're not going to stay, that's fine. I'm going to maybe take it like two minutes to let the room clear a little bit. But um, yeah, so I, I, I want to just thank you all for yeah. your questions. Um, I, 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 I admire the candor and the good intention. And I, I love what this gentleman said at the beginning of the meeting. Um, we're all of us together, and we, and we need to um, do what we can to live that. And, and, and I appreciate, I feel that. And I, th I thank you all very much. Thanks. So, yes. <laughs> I'm sorry. Did my, did my dad walk into the room? I give you respect. Will the town council be taking a straw poll to move budget items out of committee and out up for um, hearing tonight? Um, so we have, as the second item on the agenda, committee discussion. I, I, I don't know if that's going to take the form of a straw poll or. Um, uh, what, what the, I'm not exactly sure what, it'll be up to the council to determine what exactly the output of that is. And the only reason I hesitate on that is because we still do have a couple of other um, sort of mile markers on the road here of the meeting we've just discussed about having on Monday, um, as well as the public hearing on May 7th, uh, at which point we'll get um, even further additional input. So prior to the actual vote of the council on the 14th, um, uh, there, there's just other sort of opportunities to continue to receive more input. Um, Jessica, was there something you want to add? Yeah, and you know we have the public hearing on the seventh, and so I, I certainly for one want to hear what the public has to say before right. I would even entertain a straw poll. Totally agree. Okay. Right. Totally so, agree. Um, so if that influences your decision on whether or not to stay tonight, then that's fine. But. Um, <laughs> 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 So, uh, as we transition into the other couple items, I, um, did Sarah just go to the ladies' room? Okay. Um, the, the other two items, and I appreciate, first of all, the folks that are here representing CELT being patient and sitting through all that. Um, I know it's not always ideal when we've got multiple items on an agenda to sometimes have to wait. And um, the purpose of the, this item on the agenda, as you well know, I think we, we have a, a specific council workshop on May 1st. Um, so a week from yesterday, to talk about the proposed purchase here. Um, I think the Conservation Committee, or at least some, some representation of the Conservation Committee, will be at that meeting to talk about their review and assessment, because um, we had referred, referred the matter to them. Uh, we've gotten a memo back from them, but I, I think we're going to hear more um, in more detail from them. The specific reason to include this on the agenda tonight had more to do with, like the Senior Citizen Property Tax Relief Fund, since the time of the presentation of the municipal budget, we just have additional inputs. In the case of the Robinson's Woods purchase, a, a known number of, a, of approximately $200,000. In the case of the Senior Tax Relief Program, um, an actual proposal put before us. So I think it's just to talk more about those sundry list items we're certainly not decisioning anything on um, on the budget allocation tonight or anything like that. So um, I don't know if that aligns with what you all had as an expectation or not, but I, I, I just felt it was necessary to provide that, that clarification. Um, so I'll start there. Um, I, I, you're welcome to come on up if you want to make a comment. But. Thanks, Cindy. Um, Cindy Crum, Executive Director of Cape Elizabeth Land Trust. And yeah, that's exactly what we okay. thought, Jamie. And we, 
we just thought that you might talk a little bit more about where the funds might come from tonight, since this is a finance right. committee. Yep. And Great. and then on you know next week we'll be there again. Super. So um, as I said, um, when we had the presentation of the municipal budget, this wasn't something that was specifically included, correct? Right. Um, secondly, uh, we now have a known figure that we're, con you know, at least for consideration. Um, Matt, I don't know if you want to, the, the very first place I would start on this is reporting out on both the current balance and projected balance for the land acquisition fund, which okay. is primarily where we start for funding these kinds of things. So, do you want to talk about that? Sure, I'd be happy, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Uh, there's a couple of things that are, have come into play, or at least looking at the budget process and looking at what our available funding may be uh, and other sources. Right now on the current funding on the land acquisition fund, we're looking at $54,800. And in the proposed budget, there's $32,914 if the budget is approved as currently submitted. What that was that last number again? 32914 and that would be the, the penny for land acquisition that has been been included. And then uh, what I think the council may also want to consider on this at least is uh, we will probably have an insert, insertion of cash to that fund as well uh, on the eventual sale of the Ocean View, uh, piece of land on Ocean View Road, sale to the abutter, uh, the Greshens who have made the application to the council to, to purchase that piece. So we would possibly net out about $80,000 on that. So that being said, uh, with the original, I think that the original number that you're looking at was, and Cindy, please correct me if I'm wrong, 288,666? Yeah, 281. Oh, 281, okay, sorry. 281, I had the sixes. I did it one third. So 281,666, <laughs> not bad. Uh, so, so that would, if you took all of those three sources of funding, uh, that would leave a remainder of $113,966. I'm sorry, where does the 54 come from? Uh, that is our current funding in the land acquisition fund. We currently have that in our Yeah, we had 20. anticipated 32 as the year goes by and the pension Yeah, once, uh, once, yeah, during the course of fiscal year 2019, or once the budget's approved and becomes active, that's what you would have allocated in that budget was an additional $32,900. So Matt, the total, if it's okay, Jamie, the yep. total figure was one potential, well, after the, the sale of that lot, is yep. 113 what? Ballpark 115. You might, you might as well say, yeah, 115, 114,000. The, the delta between the 281 ask and the and the available funds, the, the combined balances, which rough out to about 166, is 115. That's that's un, unaccounted for, unallocated. Does that make sense, Caitlin? But that essentially. Cleans out the land acquisition fund for the rest of the year. That would it brings be, you down to zero. Yes, that would be zeroing that that number out for for yeah. for now, and then you'd be having and a you'd zero have to balance. Wait another year for another thirty-two thousand dollars to hopefully go in. Or additional land sales. Let's, right, but I mean, proceeds correct. from land yeah. sales. Yeah, that's correct. And uh, if, if I could, Mr. Chairman, please. I did have the opportunity to meet with Cindy Crum and Elizabeth Goodspeed uh, the start of the week, and uh, they had provided, and we'll, we'll have this for next week as well, uh, the revised language uh, that was recommended by the uh, Conservation Committee. So we'll have that already. Uh, she's, she's emailed that over to me, and we'll have it ready for the council to take a look at. But there was no opposition to that, and she's since integrated that language. So that's, that's been there as well. Yeah. What was their like closing date? Like, what's the date they need the money by? Do you anticipate? Go ahead, Cindy. April 2019. Well, well, I, I just said we didn't even know before. We don't know, but I'm just going to show up with a check that day. <laughs> Sooner rather than later, probably. <laughs> Tomorrow. <laughs> need time 
time to figure out what we're going to do. If Otherwise. Right. So, Matt, is a, a safe assumption that it, it, earlier you were talking about the addition of $90,000 yeah. when we were talking about the school resource officer, if the delta between these two figures is about 115, I'm assuming it's roughly the same impact on the right. Seven cents on the mill right, Mr. Chairman. So, <laughs> yep, I've done it for everything that we have available for discussion tonight, so <laughs> as well as accumulated totals. So, yep. yeah. so um, that's what we would have to consider um, going forward. If, if, if I, if I may, yep. well, there, I did speak with our auditors today as well uh, regarding uh, in the past, the, the, the town has used unassigned fund balance funds for this approach. So which, if you wanted to use that, there is, I, mean, I can get into a longer discussion about this, uh, and I'm prepared for that as well, but there is available funding in that to use that if you didn't want to put that on the mill rate, you could transfer that amount into the land acquisition fund from the unassigned balance and then fund it through the budget. And it would be a no impact on your on the tax rate. Chris, I, I just wanted to make a comment for everyone watching at home and those in the audience that um, I did want us to at least be cognizant of and at least recognize. And I'm not saying this in any way should say that we shouldn't do it or do it, but we should at least have the discussion or the awareness of that if this is put into a land trust, it does pull it out. It makes it tax exempt unless the land trust agrees to voluntarily pay. So we will be experiencing at my rough calculation, and obviously you guys can buy it anyway and put it in a tax exempt, even if we don't contribute, we would be experiencing approximately a $14,000 or so a year drop in uh, tax revenue if it enters the land trust. Um, obviously you could put it in on your own even if we don't contribute. So it is what I just wanted to know that I wanted people to know I'm cognizant of that and it's going to be part of my decision making process so Sarah I just want to remind everyone that the comprehensive plan survey came back and I hope you've all looked at it. it's incredibly interesting and I think helpful driving decisions around the budget um, but you'll see the graph that has to do with people um, desiring and appreciating open land and passive recreation and trails by far tops the list of any other priority. It's at like 96%. You look at the graph, it's all orange. It's why they moved here. It's why they don't want to move out of here. It's what they value literally above everything else. And just a reminder that it's for all ages. Um, there's, I know we get some comments about how the schools only serve a certain demographic, and that's true, although schools are incredibly important. This serves everybody from, from toddlers to, to um, you know, senior seniors. And so I just have always felt it's incredibly important. I think that's backed up by the survey. Um, and I'd love at some point to have a conversation with that as a background, and I think we'll be discussing this in the comp plan, to figure out a way to um, fund that land acquisition um, fund more robustly. At the very least, put more than one penny and maybe two, or maybe each year we go up by a penny. Many towns around us have land bonds of four and five million dollars. Um, they're much more aggressive about saving for um, purchasing open land. And when we partner with South, obviously it's a huge win-win. We get the land for a third of what the cost would be. So obviously I'm a huge proponent, I always have been, but I just would remind you that the citizens echo that unequivocally. So, so I'd like to hold off on getting too deep into the sort of the merits of the of the, I, what I really wanted to have us understand tonight was the, the actual budget implications from the proposal. So um, if there are questions or other comments specifically relative to that, if not, I think we can move on. But with something else you want to add? I, I just had one point of clarification, and, and I'm sorry, I may have misspoke, Council Lennon. It's actually two pennies. Oh. <laughs> just, just say. <laughs> I just wanted to make sure that I, I, I didn't want to undersell that. That's all, because I knew the math wasn't working out there. So it is actually two pennies as it is now. So you're okay. Kate, that's your driver. Caitlin, then Jessica. You can go ahead. Uh, so our, we're back to the looking at the budget implications of the land trust request, the SRO, and the senior tax uh, break that we need to fund. Correct. We're back on that. 
the combination of the well, three? Yeah, I mean, all of all of these again were yeah. were um, proposals or ideas or line items that were not included in our previous review of the municipal budget okay. that have come up since, and I'm I'm just trying to facilitate an understanding for everybody of what those implications would be, so that okay. as we go forward in both deliberation and ultimately decision making, we've got a full understanding of all those things. So, so the if. No, no, go ahead. And, and in, in the interest of being respectful of the, the folks from the land trust that are here in their time, if, if, there are, if there are no other comments about that, then we can, I think, move off of that as a specific I, item and then. Okay. So. Well, I've got a comment. I go think, ahead, um, uh, I think to date we have given, it's close to a million dollars to the land trust for various properties and so forth, which is a great deal of taxpayer money. And the open space, uh, open space and trails are, are absolutely uh, beloved by our folks, and we know that. Um, I think that we are facing, you know, with what the s schools want, a 10.2%, actually, that'll be the tax increase. Uh, we need to fund the senior, uh, tax break, that's gonna cost us, I think you said at least 75,000 this year and that will, you know, that may go up. I, you know, I'm, at this point, I am not willing to spend more than we have now in our land acquisition fund for the land trust. I do believe they have a fund as well. I think, they don't, don't you have a, about 160,000 in a fund? I think that we have much more pressing needs now. I think this property is a very nice property, but it's not critical. I don't, I don't see this as a critical property. It's, um, I think it's a great deal of money, and I think that we have interests that are more critical. So I, I, I'm, I'm happy to give what, or I would support giving what we have in our land acquisition fund today, which is kind of what we put in our proposed budget. That's what it was at the time. Um, the other thing that concerns me is we, we have our land acquisition fund and you know I, I don't always want to be wiping it out for the land trust because what if we have something of the towns? And so I, I'd like to you know be proactive about the town's interests as well. I mean they've been a land trust has been a great partner on many occasions, but given some of the other things we're facing as a town, I, I don't think this is the year to give any more than what we have on our land acquisition fund. So, my thoughts. Matt, is there any um, sense of when the um, proceeds from the potential final finalization of that sale, what's the timing on that? It'll be over the summer, early to mid at the latest, I think. Okay. Because um, I'm uh, in the process of having conversations with the, um, Mr. Gresham's attorney. But they are, they are anxious to also get that taken care of. Mm -hmm. Caitlin? Uh, so my question was to the unassigned fund balance. If you take 114,000 out of that, what does it do to that? Okay. Uh, I can give you plenty of answers on that as well, Council Jordan. Uh, what we are looking at right now is at the end of our last audit, uh, at the end of our last audited year, fiscal 2018, we had a fund balance of roughly 4,122,499. Okay. Yep. Four one two two four nine nine. In the current budget, what we are looking at is three hundred seventy-five thousand dollars to offset, to basically to, to offset our expenses, uh, to benefit to the taxpayer, as well as an additional five hundred thousand dollars of that that is being used towards capital expenditures that we have, with uh, the itemized listing that what you've seen for our capital expenses. So. With those two expenses being deducted from the original balance, we're looking at an unassigned fund balance of three million two forty seven four ninety nine. So if you take out the additional hundred and you know, hundred and fourteen thousand more or less, that would that would also bring that down. Uh, now, uh, if you don't mind me rambling on for a couple extra minutes here, I think it's important to just touch on a couple of critical points here, and that is that the town council in October of 2011 created an unassigned fund balance policy. 
that identified that you need to have approximately one twelfth or eight point three three percent of what our overall general fund operating revenues were from the prior year. Okay, so that number of at the end of our most recent audit it was thirty seven million five thirty five and seventy one bucks. So let's look at one twelfth of that. That gives us uh, well, if you want to maintain the floor that was established at one, you know, one one twelfth, that you should have a balance of no less than three million one twenty six six seventy one. Say that number again. I have it all on memo. Three, I can send it three, to you. One, two, six. <laughs> three one two six six seventy one. So we would go below. We would so go. so now, if you were to, you know, the way the way that it's proposed to use our unassigned fund balance, and this is this comes back to recommendations that were provided to us via the auditors. Remember back through the best of time earlier this year uh, that we needed to use some of that fund balance to, to, to bring us in line. So that would bring us uh, roughly at 103.9% without using the, any money for the land trust. Uh, that's well within the established range that they want us to be at, either at that floor or, but no greater than 115% of what that is. So the ceiling is like, Basically, you might as well say the, the floor is 3.1, the ceiling is 3.6. I mean, I, I'm rounding up a little bit on both of those. But Matt, at the conclusion, um, or tomorrow, yep. can you circulate that to everybody yep. Yep, I'd be so happy they have to. a reference and we can post that too? Yep, so, so that's, that's pretty much what we're looking at there. So you still fall within meeting your requirements of the, of the 112th if you, if you use the funds in that way, but there's not a great amount of wiggle room left at that point. No. I don't, don't want to go too far afield with this, uh, that's an incredibly tight window, it seems to me. If the concept of having this fund is it's a rainy day fund during the flush years, which arguably is what we're in, even though that's not what's happening with the schools, and then we draw in on the lean years when we're in the economies in shambles, that's an incredibly tight window. And that's the policy that we set, or did the auditors have told us? And is that what we see in other municipalities? At one point in time, it was significantly less. Okay. Um, what you find in many towns is they do not carry a balance that is, a, the, the council said that. They had an original policy that was, that was more restrictive but a lower amount, and there, it, it has been a bit of a guideline. Uh, ah, so it's, it's not firm, it's a rough. Yes, yeah. however, some towns, a uh, town I used to be on a council for, had it built into our charter that we had to set aside two twelfths of our annual operating budget. And then we had an unassigned fund balance policy that made us set aside another 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 one twelfth. So we basically set aside a quarter of the year, and it, and it looks really good. It hogtied us mm. from being able to meet some of our capital expenditures or, or needs in going in the, into the future. Uh, on the other hand, by having a fund balance that is, and that's still that's still uh, speaking with the auditors today. That is an excellent thing to have. We benefit from that by having more favorable terms when it comes to interest rate. comes to bonding. Yeah. So we, it, it helps us maintain a, a more secure and a more attractive bond rating. So that helps us. So by having that as our baseline, and you, know, you, can, as long, you can drop below it as long as you satisfy that within the coming year. And I know we will, uh, you know, we'll have, you know, we'll come back in the coming year, but that's what we have. We know the known numbers now. I guess that makes sense. I, I, I didn't put the SRO in so that. We're, not fun, we're just that. talking about the land trust, okay, funding the land trust. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, the one, SRO, it's a different project. Okay. Yep. So if we fund the land trust, that's when we go to 3.12? That's when you drop down to, if you give me just a quick second, I got to get my glasses back on. So it's within. Yes. We at that time would be about 3.13413. We're still above it at that point in time, if if, the, if you were to use that allocation. Um, the one, the other thing that I would say is, uh, just inserting the concept of the SRO there, I would I would strongly recommend against using an assigned fund balance for operational costs. I, I got yeah. Okay. That's that would be under your operational funds okay. as well. Yeah. So if you. Uh, so the one area of of the three items that yeah, you yeah. have to bid. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We got into 3.1, which is still in the range. Yeah. Suggested, but it's slightly out of 
Yeah, and we'd still be above the the, flo the floor, but uh, yeah, you still well, you still be within within the bounds of of the policy. Jessica, uh, where did this proposal to use unassigned fund balance for the land trust originate? Just a concept, Council Lennon. That uh, sorry, Council Sullivan. That I wanted to bring forward. Uh, it had been used in the past okay. in a, by prior councils on on. Before our policy. Land. Yeah, on, yeah, under land purchases. I mean, I, I think that that's a bad idea. The unassigned fund balance is uh, an extremely important uh, account. It would, I think, would be terribly irresponsible to use it for anything other than the, the crisis for which we maintain it. And um, I, you know, I remember well when we created the policy, we were encouraged to do that by government accounting standards that something came through to municipalities throughout the United States. I think it was, was 2011. R originally, Wasn't it, was it, a, it, was, it was rewritten in, uh, in a, well, the policy ago. goes actually back to 2004 in Cape Elizabeth, and then it was rewritten in 11, uh, but it at that time was trying to bring the town into mm -hmm. alignment with, it, with GASB or government accounting standards uh, 54 yeah. is they, they, they that's kind of the the, the book mm -hmm. on how you need to at least allocate or identify what you have for for fund balances. Mm -hmm. I I'm so opposed to this that concept. I I can't be more opposed to that or spending any of our unassigned fund balance on anything other than for which it is created, which is to protect the town should there be a disaster of some kind, and we can meet our obligations for a month that protects our bond rating. Um, we work hard to maintain that, and we, we shouldn't be using that for something like a gift. We have a land acquisition fund. We might, you know, we, that might be funded a little more, but I think using an our unassigned fund balance for anything other than what it, it's intended to do is, is, uh, is fiscally incredibly irresponsible. Again, I just want to refocus that the, the main purpose of the discussion here was to understand what the ask was, what the budget implications were, so that, yeah. that's all we're trying to put on the table. Um, are, are there other comments about the specific to the land trust um, request? Because I'd like to move on to um, the senior citizen proposal and then any other discussion on the SRO. But um, so, um, so the other item, and Again, feel free to stay or not. Um, the other item was what um, Clint and Matt brought forward um, at our last monthly meeting, um, which was the proposal for targeted citizen, senior citizen property tax relief. Um, so, so what we saw was again, sort of a, a framework based largely on Scarborough's model. Um, I think it's very similar to a lot of the other towns and communities that have this. Um, so one of the things that I had asked Matt, um, so, so once again, he's got here at the $75,000 allocation, what that impact would be to the mill rate, Matt. Happy uh, to call Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Um, so um, one of the things that I mentioned in my comments when we looked at this at our last month's meeting when Clint presented it, um, you know, there are a lot of sort of parameters and variables within this that I think we could have discussion on about how to best tailor for our community. Um, just one example being, um, I, I think as currently constructed here, the residency requirement is 10 years. So I'm, I'm sure there, there might be um, opinion on whether or not that's the appropriate amount, whether it should be more or less, et cetera. So um, anyway, based on how you move those different input variables, it could have impact on the projected take-up rate, though. So if obviously you decrease the residency requirement, um, then it's likely that there would be potentially more people eligible. Um, some of the things are, are not necessarily um, uh, up for our preference or, or consider. I, I believe most of the things related to the income requirement are, are a fixed 
Income requirement Formula. generally, and uh, actually, you can, income you can you can decide on your own where okay. they're, they're at. But age is the primary driver as well. Sixty-two and, and residency as well. Uh, obviously, you have to be a main resident and okay. at least sixty-two years of age. Those are the two big ones by statute that a person needs to, to meet. So again, the the purpose of bringing this up was for people to understand what the implication would be to the budget, as it was not included in the original review that we had. Um, at our, our previous municipal budget workshops, ask questions, so on and so forth. So, Chris, uh, uh, I don't. Uh, I'm I'm a little curious as to um, how schedule-wise it will end up fitting in because I have uh, there seems like there's a number of unanswered questions that we really need to dig into. Um, and with respect to the age, my so that's for example age. That's one aspect. My understanding is there is we could decide. Oh, it's not even going to have an age requirement. It's going to be low income. That's my understanding, correct? That, that, that's, it's optional whether you include age. I, I think it's age. Uh, okay, I could be wrong. I'm trying uh, to remember. I, I believe that's, that's but then, the age driven. Uh, uh, so my understanding is it, uh, that the rented. age is optional. Yep. Yeah, I, um, think, I think the age is, is the age is by statute, and then uh, but they have, uh, and then so I think renters and owners are also by statute too. So, so renters versus owners or uh, income. There's there's just a lot for us to discuss. So I just schedule wise, how would if we set aside the money? Even it, I don't, um, which is why I was asking: is, Are we going to try to fast track? I, I schedule wise, I don't see. How, I don't understand how it fits in with the overall budget. So kind yeah, of yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, the thing that. Um, was mentioned when we first looked at this. This would obviously require an ordinance. Um, yep. So, um, as Matt and Clint pointed out, we have, I think, a lot of the language and framework to base it off of um, so that there wouldn't be a lot of original authorship. Um, and then the other thing that Matt had pointed out uh, is that as we, for example, have done um, with the earmark for the equipment for parking at Fort Williams, we often put a marker or holder in the budget for something that um, is not, you know, not fully formulated yet. Um, and then if, if this wasn't to go into effect or we decided to walk away from it, then that, those funds would revert to the, the general fund. Uh, so I, I think um, I just realized the part that I was missing then. Um, we don't have to have this all nailed down when that, whatever that decision is made each year where it's his, there's the amount you owe. Um, because it isn't part, it isn't like a homestead exemption. Right. You see the nuance I'm getting at? Yeah, it's not, uh, a, it's not a function of April 1st. It's correct, a question correct. of uh, saying that if, if, the t if the town decides to go on that, go down that direction. Because it's like a rebate that yeah. they could get and otherwise, got it. If, if I could, Mr. Chairman, one other thing. Please. Uh, if you set a certain amount of money, let's say it was $75,000 in this case, and you change the parameters as if it's 10 years versus five years or uh, just 62. Uh, the one thing uh, you do is you cap the benefit number and then it's prorated by the amount. So you find out how many people are gonna qualify for the max benefit in this case, let's say it was 75, uh, oh sorry, uh, $500. So you have 150 people who could show up to do that. Uh, if, you, if you end up uh, funding that and you find that you have now, 500 people. Now, so you just would adjust your your max cap would have to be adjusted lower to in order to meet within the parameters of what you had for available funding. So, uh, if you set a, a dollar amount at X, it would just adjust what the max benefit could possibly be, and that's a, that's within the ordinance as well that uh, that Scarborough uh, was operating under. Questions, Jessica? Yeah, uh, one of the things that. You know, we need to consider going forward with all this stuff. You know, we, the school board increase currently would be a 10.2% 10 10 tax increase. We're thinking of adding paying for their SRO, uh, paying, supporting, paying for a senior tax break, which will cost others, uh, and land trust. Uh, you know, Many people are going to lose their deductions, you know, their property tax deductions, their state income tax deductions, you know, in the next year. I mean, it's not just what we're talking about here, but there are going to be some big uh, effects that a lot of people are going to, you know, be hit with. So I, I think we need to keep that in mind with, with all these requests that we're getting. 
because the, the tax ramifications for many people in this town are gonna to be much bigger than, than what we're talking about. And I, I just, you know, the timing of everything right now is, is pretty rough. And so I, I think we need to understand the stresses that a lot of citizens are gonna be feeling, you know, that are bigger even than what we're discussing with the, the lack, the end of deductions that people are gonna have, so. Other comments? No, I, I just asked if there were other comments. Oh. I mean, the, the, the sorry. What I meant was the with the new tax tax code, people people will not many people not everybody will not be able to deduct their state income tax anymore. They won't be able to deduct their property taxes anymore, and we we got to remember that. That's the key. Go ahead. I, just, I just wanted to thank you for bringing that up. I hadn't contemplated that, and I think that's a very important point. So thank you for bringing that up. Um, I mean, the only, the only context that I would, and I agree, I mean, it, 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 none of these things exist, sorry, none of these things exist in a silo, right? It's, it's all part of a bigger picture, so I think that's important. Um, the thing that really stuck with me going through last year's budget cycle was the number of people, um, uh, number of aging people in the community that came forward or and either spoke at meetings or emailed us or you know spoke to counselors individually um, that remarked about you know their inability to keep pace. Um, that was juxtaposed, I think, against a lot of other um, other voices that I heard in the community that said, you know, we'd be willing to pay more than our fair share um, to um, to support different things. And so, my objective with this all along has been to have something that strikes a bit of a, a chord um, to satisfy both of those interests, um, and um, whether or not it is able to completely offset. Um, yeah, I, I don't think it's a one for one, obviously, but it's an effort, it's something. It's better than nothing, in my opinion. Um, so, um, and I think um, in, in the relative scheme of the overall municipal budget, it's a pretty small amount, too. So it can have real impact and value to the people who have a true need without being you know, an enormous uh, uh, expenditure. Are, are you specifically referring to the senior tax yeah. break? Yeah, sorry. I, I'm, yeah. I'm not arguing with that no, per I se. I'm, I'm just taking, I'm, I'm I was looking, looking at you, but it's picture. for the benefit of everybody. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. You, you, had, you had made the most recent comment, so it, it, that, I, wasn't, I wasn't trying to be argumentative with you. Valerie. Um, Matt, can you just run through the numbers, the effect on the mill rate, if we were to include all of the things, the land trust, the SRO, and the senior tax, and then can you break it down by each one? I'd be happy to, Councillor Rendell. It's uh, five cents for the SRO, oh, sorry, six cents for the SRO. It is five cents for the senior citizen and, uh, tax break or tax refund, and seven cents for the land trust, and that would result in 18 cents. And what was the amount of the land trust that they're basing that on? I think it's 114,000. So 18 cents for all of them, right? Total, yep, that's the total accumulated. And can I just follow mm -hmm. up on to the, the, um, the number that you have right now for the, the senior tax um, initiative, how, what does that, Contemplate. Does that the proposal we got, where it would be the age 62? Yeah, it's seventy-five thousand dollars. It would be the, the gross number added to the uh, to the expenditures, and then it would be for 60, you know, person 62 years of age, and the other parameters being influx. And does that? Do you anticipate that that would accurately reflect, like the number that you have, would accurately reflect the number of people who would have that need and come forward with it? I think that's a good first year. I think after year one, you'll know a lot. About, you'll you you would know a lot more. 
Uh, the one thing that Clint didn't know uh, that I spoke to him about afterwards, the, the reason why Scarborough's number jumped so dramatically the second year, uh, if you remember the, seeing that in, in his presentation, there was a, they, they had a significant amount of carry forward funding from years prior when it was linked to the, uh, the state circuit breaker program. Uh, so many more people got knocked, or so many people got knocked out of that from qualifying that they kept carrying forward the amount that they had funded each year. So they had a pretty significant number that was in a carry forward balance in that account. So finally, after they had adjusted it, that, that new year or year one of the new paradigm, if you will, uh, showed like they had, they had put like 25,000 in, but the actual money amount was more like 175 to 200,000. It was in that type of range. So, yeah. So then year, yeah. So the second year, the NILFs and the, the council funded it at the accurate level of what, what was financed the year before. But I think, I think the 75 was a good estimate uh, for year one. Any other discussion on that? Any other discussion on any of the other items? We talked quite a bit about the SRO. Is there anything else anybody wanted to say on that? So um, technically, per our agenda, we have a second item of just overall discussion. And prior to that, um, is there anybody from the public that wishes to make any public comment on this next agenda item? Tom? Do you mind just coming up? Sorry. <laughs> Tens of people watching at home. <laughs> Tens. Tom Donovan, Donovan at 11, Thanks. Becky's Cove Lane. Um, how did you arrive at the age 62 on that? Because if you look at people that are um, in today's environment, people are working, many of us are, including myself, at 70. So why is it 62? Why isn't it 65 or 70? Let's go ahead now. Mr. Dunham, I, I would like to say that it was something I came up with, but it came from our good friends at the legislature. That was the age they set. Any other <laughs> public comment? Okay. Um, so, you know, we just have overall discussion, you know, given the hour and given the comments that were already made about us having, um, you know, still uh, a bit of a way to go down the road. Um, before we get to uh, our vote on the 14th, I'm not sure if there's a lot to discuss um, beyond what we've already had comments about, but I open the floor to that now too. Sarah, microphone. I have a couple of just a question. Do we, can we hold the public hearing like basically now with sort of the vagueness of what we're thinking? Or do we have to put a number out there for people to show up on the 7th? Like, are we supposed to come to some consensus on the number we want to put out, or are we sort of good with how much we've discussed this, and we just let people come way in? I mean, the number floating out there is 10.2, but do you see what I'm saying? Do we, do we need something specific for people to react to, or are we just really open-minded listening, and we don't really nail that number down to the 14? So, Deb's nodding next to me, but do you want to kind of What Matt and, I, Matt and I have been discussing is, on May 1st, which is next Tuesday. Tuesday, along with your workshop, there has to be a special town council meeting to set the number to go to public hearing on the 7th. And so we've been trying the last two nights to try to gauge of what the draft motion will be to bring to you on May 1st. And you can certainly tweak that next Tuesday night. And I don't know how, how Matt's going to propose you know, the agenda with the different scenarios you've been talking about with or without an SRO, the cell money, and, and so forth. So um, we're going to have to talk about that to see so that folks can have the numbers. And generally what happens is when it goes to public hearing, um, I think we've always been under the understanding that you may come in with a lower number that you finally adopt on the 14th. But I don't think it can go higher than that. So, would, would we effectively, on May 1st, have a Chinese menu of sorts? Mm -hmm. You'd have a pro forma, like of two sorts, a, B, maybe two or three. three. And then um, so we, so we, we talk about the, the building, and then we sort of meet as a council. I won't be here, but to me, and we, and we try to carve out which option we can all agree with, not as a final number, but as what we, we're going to listen to. 
What, what do you want to take to public hearing? Which, which is it's basically, an, uh, uh, with all due respect, Council, it's an, it's an a la carte option in the sense that the council can decide which, which options they would like, and I'll try to put out all three different formats with different performers. It may be a long agenda with very little actually to, to decide on there. Caitlin? Sorry. From what you're saying, it sounds advantageous of us to just put a number out there that includes all three because you can't add later, but you can take away. That's always been An option. how, you know, my understanding and how the town is run the budgets before, it's always been said that, you know, if you go higher, essentially you're, you have to have another, you could be yeah. looked at as substantially right. changing what was put out to public hearing. Right. So you'd have to have another public hearing. So I'm just saying, so it would make, in my mind, sense to just put the number out, including all three, have the public hearing, and then at the, you know, and then you set right. the number after that. So, I mean, it's just, it seems we'd be having a big hash about what number to put out on Tuesday night, and then say we only put one thing in, and then we get to the public hearing, and you have, you know, hundreds of people show up that want the other thing, and we still yeah. want the one thing that we hashed out, and now we can't go up higher without having another public hearing. So I'm just suggesting go to all that maybe we just put the number out there that includes all three, with the understanding that we're going to hear from the public and then we could roll the number back. That's good. I think that's a good suggestion. So, yeah. I, I was just going to say this, um, <laughs> maybe one of those times that you're not voting on your final number on the night of the public hearing, it gives you a week to, to uh, digest what citizens have said at the public hearing and maybe follow up emails. And so that's one of the reasons over the years that, and I think the that I ask all the time. encouragement throughout <laughs> the years is to not vote on something that important the same night as your public hearing. Right. So we can finalize it next Tuesday, but is, is there general consensus among those here, uh, sort of for what Caitlin just outlined? Mm -hmm. I'll get to that. Yeah. Okay. Matt, there was one other item that you wanted to bring up for our awareness. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have one additional bonus item. Uh, after speaking, uh, thankfully, with Council Straw last week, uh, we were discussing capital items over a million dollars. And we were discussing somewhat about, you know, there was nuance about the fact that we have a ladder truck, about the quint that the fire chief has requested. That's over a million dollars, although we had broken it up into five different ex increments it still is one capital item over a million dollars. And speaking with bond council, uh, they have stated that we need to put that out to the referendum. So, um, we no, were, pardon? No, keep going. Uh, so, later. So, so yeah, so I've worked with uh, Jim Safian, who's our bond council, to craft the wording for that question. We'll, we'll have that ready for next week to do it. So, um, Tell them to find one for 909. <laughs> The, <laughs> Councilor Jordan, the, the, the conversation was held. <laughs> Let's just say, uh, it's not my first rodeo. It's my, it may be my first fire truck, but it's not my first rodeo. So the, the, quite, the conversation was held, believe me. And uh, so. Okay, that's what I was going to ask. Can we, yeah. when can we put it out for? No, that's, yeah, it that's, would, that's before, yeah. yeah, it would. It would it, nope, it will go as a second question on the same ballot as the school budget question, so it would just be question number two on there. Perfect. We'll ha but we'll ha we will have that ready, but I wanted to let council know that that's the direction we were Could going. Could we have ranked choice on model or anything like that? <laughs> <laughs> that's a great... Hot Wheels yeah, versus Tom Yeah, there's yellow cars out there. Yellow rather than... Yeah, yeah. yeah. that's going to be ranked choice voting on. But in 3D, it would be like color yeah. model. Yeah. Yeah. Any other discussion or comments? <laughs> Sorry. I think I agree. Nope. Is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. <laughs> Seconded by Jessica. All in favor? Thanks, everybody. Thanks, you.